Yeah. Bernard's a student of mine. His, his shots turn out awesome. But go ahead. After your water, ask your question. <laughs> uh, uh, hey, Adam. Hey. Hey, I'm re really, uh, really mind blown by uh, watching your short dead Spider Man verse that you know. It's yeah. Going all, <laughs> all over the. So I have a little bit doubt. So before starting the shot, you have uh, done any 2D stuff like you know, like uh, what is thumbnail kind of stuff or like storyboarding? Did you plan like that way? Because I have seen all this thing of you have uh, shown in your work culture, like you have done the layout, like simple. Yeah. Layout. Yeah. So did you have, uh, did you really care about the 2D stuff kind of you know thumbnail or? Um, I kind of. It was a little bit of thumbnailing. What I actually, because one thing that I wanted to make sure I was getting correct was um, making it feel like Spider-Man in terms of his posing. And um, my main source of reference for that was looking at the comics um, and also uh, I looked a lot on Pinterest because um, Pinterest is actually surprisingly yeah. amazing for animation. It's got so much good stuff on there. Yeah. And so basically, I just studied through Pinterest and made like a little library of all different Spider-Man poses that I liked, and then kind of used some of those I actually stuck to quite closely, and others I kind of adapted to what I felt was like a stronger pose. So it's kind of a combination of the both, but I didn't look at so much. Um, I didn't look for like because I know some people look at. For example, like parkour or slightly more like realistic, you know, performances of people moving that way. And I didn't really look into that so much because, you know, I felt like people had already done that research to decide what kind of posing Spider-Man would look like. And I kind of, I kind of tried to break it down myself and think what makes a Spider-Man pose. Um, and so I kind of looked at it that way. So it's mostly through Pinterest and then kind of using my own creative license to come up with something similar. So you uh, you agree that idea of that you know, that two D stuff like you know storyboard or whatever that uh, thumbnail or is it really helpful? This kind of shots, you know. So that yeah. like, you know, every every frame is changing. Every frame like uh, camera is a character or the uh, character is the character. You know, a straight head kind of is the you can say it is the father of the straight head. Animation. Yeah, I think um, I always encourage people to draw in that sense and like uh, as you'll see today there is actually a lot of stuff from storyboards that I also kind of are inspired by and kind of inherit uh, some of that stuff as well so I think it's really important to, I don't think it's critical because I know some incredible animators who don't draw um, but at the same time, I feel like it's a good practice because it will train your eye to know what kind of um, no. like shapes, yeah, what shapes work in their design. And that's something that I want to cover quite closely today is kind of how, how you can use the design of the character to make your poses stronger and what makes uh, like certain shapes, what like, you know, what, you know, uh, the way I think about it is a concept the shape artist. Of the character. Yeah, yeah, the concept artist and the art department have specifically chosen certain shapes to make that character iconic. And so I feel like it's also important for animators to think about that and try and use those shapes in a way that you can help your performance. Cool. And one more question I have. So, apart from the when you uh, animate this kind of you know, stuff, you know, like dynamic, like camera is a character and the uh, uh, character is a character, you know. Sometimes camera is there, the character is there, you know, the flow is there. Yes. So you, that time you really uh, care about the perspective view, the how it looks like in perspective view. Maybe sometimes it don't look like good at perspective view, but for the sh uh, sh uh, shape of the, uh, I mean, shape of the uh, view of the camera, we yeah. do a little bit different. So you really do uh, care about the perspective view, or you just think about the how it looks like in the Camera. Um, I yep. think I think both are important. So, from both, I think it's important to both think about what things look like in actual space as well as what they look like in the camera when it comes to your posing, because 
um, you want it to feel correct from all angles and that way there's nothing that, because sometimes in my experience, I used to pose things directly to camera and even though for one angle it might look correct, when you start to move it in, when you start to add movement to it, it starts to like lose its volume in certain ways that you didn't expect. And so in that sense, I think for your main key poses, it's really important to actually pose from every angle and make it feel like that's actually something that would be anatomically correct. And then from there, when you start to go into your in-betweens and your breakdowns, that's where I feel like you can take slight more leverage and you can start to take things slightly out of proportion because it's going to be through the movements so you won't notice it as much. But I would still personally try my best to keep everything like correct anatomically throughout the shot, and then that will probably that's probably going to make it feel more believable later. But uh, the main feel of the thing is that uh, we should uh, feel good in this the uh, viewpoint. Uh, what we try to present in for the in the audience. That's what you want to say. That uh, yeah, feel. yeah. So I think. Yeah, it's definitely... There is no hard and fast rule that, that it's need to uh, look good in that view, that view. But I, don't, know what I, want. I don't think it's... I don't think it's critical at the end of the day. At the end of the day, you're only going to look through the camera. So yeah. I feel like if something is going to look better, even if you cheat it to the camera, then maybe sometimes it's good to take that creative license and like, break things slightly. But yeah. I I know a lot of people who will say you shouldn't break you shouldn't break something and I don't feel like breaking is wrong. I feel like there's a difference between breaking the rig and like or like breaking something and then breaking it. There's like breaking it and then there's breaking it smart. <laughs> mm. That's the way I see it. So if you're breaking it in a way that kind of enhances the performance and mm. you don't notice it, but you rather feel it, then I think that's okay. And for a little bit knowledge from my side, I think we break that, you know, the phenomena. That's why uh, you people created the really beautiful shots, some kind of spider parts, that is, which is maybe not, is, not that, you know, Dramatically correct this animation sense. Mm. <clears throat> like a really, really beautiful shot, which maybe not that much of, you know, animation perception kind of look good, kind of this thing. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I didn't, I didn't quite grab what you were asking. Sorry. <laughs> cool. Oh, I think it was just complimenting you. And how good it oh, okay. was. Um, but we <laughs> okay. should uh, we should get started actually. It's, yeah, sure. Uh, let's go. Let's go ahead. Yeah. So um, feel free to you know introduce yourself and yeah. Sure. Um, do I? Um, oh, I how gave do you, I get my sheet uh, screen to share? Uh, if you go down the bottom and a green yeah. square will pop up. That's oh, how yeah. you share. I got it. So I made you a host already. So nice. Feel free. Go nuts. So you guys should be able to see what I'm doing now. Uh, yep, I can see your screen. Awesome. So, yeah, sure, I'll just introduce myself. So, um, my name's Aaron Baker. I am a senior animator at Jellyfish Pictures. And I'm also a freelance content creator at Frame by Frame Animation. Um, today we're mostly going to be speaking about how, uh, what my role is at Frame by Frame and kind of how that all came about and how I personally would go about breaking down on the shot. Um, so first things first, I just wanted to introduce what Frame by Frame is. I'm sure a lot of people here are already aware of, uh, of the page. But essentially, it's an online service um, which is promoted through social media, be it through Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. And what we do is we essentially look at uh, artwork, be it from animation to illustrations to compositions, and we try and decipher them uh, using the knowledge that we've gained through our experience in industry uh, to try and demonstrate how that artist may have gone about executing what they've done. Um, so what I can quickly do is just play this little introduction of what frame by frame is. Um, and I should let you also know that this is, uh, we just want to say thank you to 
uh, Agora Studio, who gives us a small funding to keep this alive, and um, it helps us like bringing new artists um, to yeah to make this in a whole, this whole, whole thing possible. So what I'm going to show you now is a couple of uh, clips that I've done for frame by frame, um, just deciphering some animation and then. What we'll do is we'll go through some of my own shots and do the same process. So you can actually see me doing it live and then you'll feel free to ask questions on the way. So I'll just play a couple of clips that I've done for them. And then this is just a quick demonstration of what their main their main um, format is through Facebook. And so this is where most of the artists post their stuff. So you can see things from like Klaus, for example, where they took a screenshot and then they've broken down um, they've broken down the composition. Um, so another thing that I just wanted to show you was kind of how I came about being approached by frame by frame. So I since I started studying animation, even from when I was at university learning it, um, I found that the best way to learn how to animate better would be through looking at other people's work and seeing not only, it's not just about learning the principles, but seeing how they're addressed and how they're applied. And everyone has a slight different mindset about when they approach a shot. So I would look at other people's work and think, how, how have they gone about this? And the only real way to do that is by knowing what you know, what you've gained, like what knowledge you think you have in the industry, and trying to apply that into someone else's work. And then maybe you'll start to inherit things or learn things differently from how they've approached the shop. So just for example, I this is one that I did before I joined Frame by Frame. Um, I'll just mute the, this shot because it's just noise. <laughs> but... What I was looking at here is there was a shot in Frozen 2, which I really liked, and it was mostly how the spine was working through her body. And you can see the energy kind of lift up and down. And so I was using three different points to track her body and see how the chest would separate from the hips and how the head would separate from the chest. And I wanted to see how those curves are working to kind of feel that energy. Um, Another piece I did was a piece from Ratatouille, which is actually one of my favorite shots from the movie. I, I just thought it was very appealing. and I wanted to try and break down the acting choices and the posing and the timing and try and get a feel for how they approach the shot. So Aaron, are you tracking it in Sing Sketch? Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I basically what I do is I'll grab the shot from online and then I'll uh, chuck it into Sing Sketch and then I'll draw over it and give it notes. Mm -hmm. And I used to do this for myself. So basically, this what I used. I started to share this with people because I thought, why should I be the only person to learn from this? Maybe someone else might as well. Mm -hmm. So I started to upload them online and it started to get some recognition. And the one that kind of made the catalyst into this whole thing of frame by frame was this one now, uh, which is with, um, it was a milk curl shot from 101 Dalmatians. And I really loved the posing and the composition and just the timing. Of course, milk curl has incredible timing. So I was just, it was quite a simple shot, but I just found it so fun. And so I broke that down and I put it on Twitter and the founder of Frame by Frame noticed it. Um, his name is Maxime Pilon. Um, he's a really nice guy. And he just reached out to me and said, would you be open to becoming one of the first freelance uh, content creators for Frame by Frame? And so that's where it all began, basically. Um, and it's been really cool to work with him. And so from there, uh, we're getting to the actual what we're going to be doing today. And 
basically what I've done is I've already pre-made a breakdown for us using one of my uh, shots that I did at home for myself. And um, let's see if I can just uh, that work. Yeah. So uh, I've already pre-made a breakdown for us, and then from there we'll actually make ones on the fly as well. So I'll actually do ones live with us, and then I can um, tell you exactly what I'm doing as I do it. So first of all, I'm just going to play this shot, uh, which is a personal piece uh, inspired by Into the Spider Verse, which um, did very, very well online, which is is very overwhelming but amazing <laughs> at the same time. So. What I've done is I've gone back into there and I've just hid the background so we can focus on the character and uh, I'll just play it once over so you can see what I was using to break down. And then from there I'll go through frame by frame and we I can discuss what notes I drew over it. And the benefit of doing this for you guys this way is Obviously, I was the one that animated this shot, so I can tell I can tell you exactly what I was thinking, as opposed to guessing. Usually, what I, when I do these things, I'm guessing what the other animator was thinking as they were doing it, um, which is a good practice. But it's I'm sure there's so much more knowledge that you could learn from them if they were to tell you how they approach the shot. So I guess to some degree, you get that benefit when we do it this time. So now what I'll do is I'll unhide all of my sketches. That's going to let me. There we go. Cool. So one thing that I try to think about when I think about posing is I think about silhouettes, I think about the design, and I think about shapes. And what I mean by shapes is I can quickly draw for you. Obviously, you get different character designs. You know, someone might have like this kind of body, <laughs> like a light bulb. <laughs> or you could have the opposite. Someone could have a really thin chest and go into like a really wide hips. And I think it's important to think about those shapes when you start doing a posing, because that's like something that's very iconic. If you think, for example, of Gru from uh, Despicable Me, he has a very iconic shape where he's almost like a triangle, where he's literally got this kind of shape, and then he's got these very dainty legs at the bottom, and he's got these very broad shoulders and then like a spherical head and a pointy nose. If I did this and someone said to me, who is that? I would probably think it was Gru. At least that's me. <laughs> so I think that's quite important to think about when you do your posing. Um, so when I was looking at Spider-Man, I was looking a lot of, um, about how they, one thing that I feel is quite iconic is the specific lines of action they use and also how they use his limbs. Because I noticed that in a, a lot of the comics, they would almost have this kind of, almost like a spider-like shape to the limbs, where like they almost feel sharp. Like they always had quite a sharp angle to them when he was like settling into a pose, and that almost made him quite spider-like, especially from a distance. Whereas, like he is also quite graceful in the way he swings. And so I tend to keep him in quite clean lines when he was traveling through the motion, through like through uh, the swing. And as he began to settle, that's when his limbs would start to come, come almost unfold. So what I've done here is I've just kind of broken down how you got my uh, line of action going all the way through the body. And then I've got clean silhouettes. So I've made sure that this line here, let's try and change the color. So I was trying to make sure that this arm had its own negative space, so it wasn't overlapping the pose. And I wanted to make sure that also the hand was the thing that traveled through uh, traveled through the pose. So I was giving like rhythm and flow to the pose as well. Um, so we want to be mostly looking in this direction where the web's traveling. And so I wanted to almost make an arrow through the pose so that you know exactly where it's moving. Um, and this is also what I wanted to try and mention about graphic shapes is um, one thing that I learned from um, a very good animator who coincidentally also works on Into the Spider-Verse called Nick Giorgio. 
um, who I had the privilege of working with, uh, once gave me this tip about if you uh, if you look at the design, you can almost simplify shapes uh, to try and make your poses more readable. So in this case, what I was trying to think of is with this back leg, let's change the color. If I make this back leg and I bend it at 90 degrees, and then it has this foot. So we got this kind of foot going now. That almost, to me, felt like I could simplify this shape so that when it flows through the body, and we've got the chest and everything, then I felt like I was almost just creating a triangle. And that's kind of, that was my intention at least. And then you've got almost like a box for the chest, and then you've got the round, you know, you've got the round head. And so I know it sounds quite simple when you think, like, it almost feels too simple in a way, but that's something that I try and think about, which you'll notice in some of my laser shots that we'll go through, is how I, you can turn a very complex pose into something, or a very complex design into something more simple, and it gives more clarity and makes your poses read more. Um, so as we go through, one thing I also wanted to mention is one of the techniques that they used on Into the Spider-Verse as well was uh, using multiples and uh, smear frames. And so what I was doing here is I was adding an extra foot um, as as we travel through this frame because he's moving such a fast distance in a very short space of time. I wanted to add an extra, I wanted to add an extra limb in there just so that you could read where it come from. Because one thing that you should do when you smear is if you had a ball and then it's going to go to another section, your smear should almost, as it comes out, you should always have a spacing where something is trailing behind and something is going forward. So in this case, it'd be kind of like this. Rather than going straight across, if I were to go, say, all the way across here, then we don't know where the pose has come from, so it makes it harder to read. So you should always have something trailing behind. And you'll notice this quite a lot in throughout the shot. Again, I just wanted to make sure throughout this, because it's very fast actions, I wanted to make sure that everything had like a very clear flow. Um, so wherever the line of action that was going through the web, I wanted that to breathe through the body as well. And you can also notice I'm keeping the silhouettes clean throughout. And then now we're kind of hitting almost like, if you think of a pendulum as as we're getting to the bottom of the pendulum swing, this is where all the weight is now going to like it's going to travel through the body of Spider-Man. So up to this point, we've had the legs trailing behind, but as soon as we've hit that pendulum, that's when the legs are going to now hit the weight and they're going to come down. So we get follow through the body. Another thing that I was that I was considering, which I try to do in all my poses, is uh, rhythm, um, and this is something that Glenn Keane used to try and push a lot in his artists, was trying to add twist to the body so that it gives it a sense of dimensionality and flow, and it gives it a rhythm. Whereas if you were to say this, doesn't feel as dynamic as this. I mean, that's a terrible drawing, but you get the idea. <laughs> um, so this is something that I was considering. So you can see, it's, it, I know it's from a distance, but it's still something that I'm consciously thinking about is I was trying to add some rhythm to the pose. And now you can see in here, the arm is leading the action. So this is also a question that I'm thinking about once I've got my in, but once I'm starting to apply my in-betweens, I'm thinking what's going to drive the action? Is it the head? Is it the hand? Is it an eye direction? Is it a foot? It could be anything. In this case, because I wanted um, Spider-Man to catch the web so that he was going to bring his momentum up to himself, I felt it was important to make sure that hand read before anything else. So I made the hand lead the action. So it grabs the it grabs the web, and then that's when we've got now an anticipation pose, which is 
Um, I also think about um, anticipations in terms of volume. So in your breakdown, you should also be considering change in like contrast and shape. So this is something that my one of my first leads taught me, uh, his name's Dan Cripps, where he would simplify. So if you had a box, you could have a very tall, thin box. And then in your anticipation, maybe it goes to a slightly wider box. So we're coming down. And then maybe it goes really long. So in the breakdown, and then as it comes up, maybe it's going to overshoot slightly, and then it can settle again. And it's this change in contrast in volume using the squash and stretch that I try and think about in my poses. So in this example, you can see how he's gone from a kind of a, in here, he's kind of a small uh, box. And in my breakdown, he's gone longer and thinner. So I'm trying to change that contrast in his volume. And then here, I added just a, a it was a very bad, <laughs> but in my opinion, I think this is quite a bad smear, but it was just enough to indicate where, where Spider-Man had, had come from, because he moved a very, just in a matter of like three or four frames, he's moved across to a different part of the screen. And I, met, I thought it was important just to indicate a little more where he had come from behind this building in order for that to read. Otherwise, he may have just flashed across the screen and you wouldn't have noticed. And to be honest, it's still very fast. But I, want, I didn't want to lose that momentum because this is something, I think one of the hardest parts for this uh, piece for me was trying to uh, keep the momentum, the momentum, like almost like I say about the rhythm and like a pendulum swing. I wanted to have this timing where it'd be like, fast, slow, fast, slow. I wanted to get that kind of momentum as though uh, almost like a yo-yo. So as it springs up and down and it has that hold at the bottom and then it flings back up, I wanted to get that timing right. Mm -hmm. And so when you're moving across screen space in such a, uh, like a very fast amount of time, it, took a, it was quite a challenge to make sure he was hitting the right space in where he needed to be and still feel that weight. Um, so again, this is just a simple like 2D smear. Um, I didn't actually do these smears in, uh, I animated this in Maya, um, and I didn't use Maya to like do my smears, basically what I did. And be a bit more, yeah, I just wanted to be more imaginative and creative with it. And I, did, I felt like I didn't have as many um, restrictions if I did it by hand, just hand drawn. So what I did was, uh, I took I once I'd rendered everything, I took it into Photoshop, and then just on specific frames, I'd paint over the top of it. Did you, um, Aaron? Did you bring in an image sequence or just one frame? Um, I'd bring in the whole sequence on right. the timeline. Okay. And then from there, I would just paint over the top. Okay, making sure the arcs are nice and flow from... Yeah, yeah exactly, so frame I could frame, frame by frame back and forth to yeah. kind of see how that was working. Sure, yep. Um, I'm sure there were probably better techniques to use than Photoshop, but at the same time I'm very, uh, like, I have, I feel quite competent in Photoshop mm -hmm. and I knew I could get what I wanted even though it was quite strenuous. Yeah. Um, so I felt like it was worth it for me at least. So, so can I just quickly ask, when you import yeah. a um, image sequence into Photoshop, is that yeah, uh, is that pretty pretty quick? It's not too slow, is it? Um, it yeah, it's not too bad. Okay, um, so it depends on well, of course, how long the shot is. In in this case, I think this was like sixteen seconds, so it's still quite long. Yeah. Um, and but it, it didn't heavy. take too long, honestly. It takes a while to open up the shot again after you've saved it and closed close the program but okay. once it's all loaded it's it's you know it just works in real time and it's fine okay just curious thanks mate yeah it's <laughs> not too bad <laughs> um so this is what i meant about like almost keeping a spider-man pose where i want to give like these like angular shapes to his limbs 
because it almost made him, to me at least, it made him feel slightly more spider-like. Um, it's going to hear, I kind of like, there's a subtle anticipation with the head and the chest so that it twists around and the, and the hand starts to drag back um, to almost anticipate the momentum of the body twisting around because it's going to do a 180 twist now. So you can see that it's like a very fast breakdown, um, but it's still things that I wanted to try and indicate even in a very short space of time. So again, this is just uh, trying to exaggerate like the stretch in the pose. So I wanted to almost feel the whole like dynamic energy flowing through the body for him to really reach out to, to fire this web against the, against the building. Um, and you can see in here, this is another technique that I thought might be quite interesting. I don't know if they use this technique on the move in the movie. They might have. You, you might know already. Um, where they almost what I try to do is make a second version of the of the pose, and it's almost felt like it was trailing behind because he was going so fast. It might make it feel like it's almost like a strobing effect. So I thought it was quite interesting, and it was quite subtle in the final result when you actually watch the clip, but I thought that might be quite an interesting technique. So you can see how it almost like, it's like multiple versions of himself are trailing behind and they catch back up again. Yeah, I don't recall seeing like a full kind of like clone, but yeah, the technique is to clone the actual pose and then you cut yeah. out the whatever body yeah, parts. Yeah, you cut sections yeah. off, yeah. I just, I, there's something about it that I thought it might be quite cool. It almost, it almost kind of gave it like a matrix feel. Mm -hmm. And again, like I say, this is, I wasn't trying to like directly, um, like copy the techniques that they were using into the spider verse, but I just felt very inspired by it. And obviously there is a lot of things that I copied from there, but also I kind of wanted to just, it was an experimentation, the whole thing. Um, so I thought that was quite fun. Mm -hmm. So you can see in here how I'm trying my best to, as it comes to the very bottom of the screen here, um, we're just touching the end of frame. But one thing that I'm, I was trying to keep awareness of was I've got my safety gate for my camera, which is probably something like this. And this is the area that you shouldn't really go across because then you start to push out a frame. But when you've got a very fast motion, you can almost use it to guide the camera, to force it to uh, change its angle. Because your character should always lead your camera. Your camera should never be a uh, character. So in this um, in this case, as he drops down, he's dropping down so fast that he actually um, like exceeds the safety gate for a split moment, and then the, cam the camera slightly catches up, and then he comes back into the bottom left third. And that was something that I tried, but it took quite a long time to get that timing to feel right. But I think it works in the end because it really feels like the camera's like, oh god, I've got to catch up with them. And it gives it a bit more weight. So, again, this is something that I was uh, thinking about in terms of graphic shapes. <laughs> and it's, it looks silly, but there's something about it that I was trying to like actively be aware of is trying to simplify my shapes. Now, that may not read as Spider-Man in this pose, but it reads as like a volume that's going to change. And if I, I could have easily separated those legs out so that let's say it was like, let's change the color again. So let's say I changed it so the, the legs like this, there's something about that that makes the makes the pose more complex than it needs to be, and it takes you like it may even be a tiny sec like split seconds, but it'll take that tiny bit longer to read what's happening. And I feel like using very clear and very simple um, in your poses to, especially in moments like this where it's very fast, so that everything reads. But after the anticipation, I've gone straight into a smear. Well, there's like a small smear here where you can see that the hand is trailing back um, and I'm really pushing that line of action. So I've essentially got this curve where it does this 
and I wanted to make sure that the body stayed along that curve throughout its movement. And then you'd really feel that energy being pulled through. Again, yeah, so saying about the line of action. And again, trying to, even though I've now broken out of that line, I still wanted to inherit still slight some of that curve. So I tried to still create the shapes where the arm was, the arm down to the leg would still kind of form that line so that it made it slightly easier to read and looking at that now i'm actually in this pose for example the arm is actually breaking out of that and i think if i were to do it now i probably just kept the arm where it was and that might have helped break that line um so this section is probably my favorite smear that i did <laughs> um where I went quite abstract with it in in sense of like its shapes, where I was really, if I can turn, there you go. So you can see how like there's this very clear, like graphic line, and then these almost like slightly more abstract versions of multiple limbs, and the hat and the head really pulling back. Um, to just see how fast of a motion, so you still read some of where it came from. Um, again, these spider-like poses. So I kind of treated it almost like it was either an X or, well, yeah, I guess it would be an X of some kind, whether that had like curves to it. My intention was that the head would, you know, it'd be in one of these and then you'd have like these splayed out limbs and it kind of made it feel more like a spider. So again, adding an anticipation, again, more multiple like smears for fast actions and it was quite i felt it was quite important for for spider-man to feel like he was really throwing his weight so i wanted to feel like he was pulling and like he, in order to like throw himself forward he was really like almost thrusting forward with his like pelvis area um, and trying to like funnel this line so that it was really going this direction so that everything was driving from the hips to try and make him throw himself forward. And then it breaks out of it quite quickly. So now he's starting to settle out so that he can twist into the other direction. So there's a, a subtle anticipation with the hand before it fires to shoot the web. And again, keeping in mind that we've got clear silhouettes here. So, you know, you've got the negative space around every, everything. So every part of the body is reading. Well, it still feels an anatomically correct. And I was actually, I was very grateful to have Nick, um, who I mentioned earlier, who was actually working on Spider-Verse at the time. Um, I asked him if he would have a look over this when it was kind of slightly more in a blocking phase. And he went over and kind of just sculpted a little more, some like tried to clean up some of the poses, like we mentioned earlier, to almost make it more simple, um, which was really useful. They were only like, they were very subtle changes, but they made quite a big impact to like the graphic design of his character. Um, so there was one in particular, which I mentioned earlier, which he, which he was completely his idea, and I thought that was actually that's a really good point. And it was very, it's only you probably don't even notice it, but you feel it. So this was a case with where Nick, um, like, just told me to keep this leg because I think I what I was doing was I was tucking the leg in too early, and he said in order for that to read more, I'd keep the like the line of action really flowing through the body. And so he said to keep that leg trailed back and it made a big difference. And then it starts to come out. It's only like a one frame difference, but there was just something about that that made it feel like a little more dynamic. Hey, um, Aaron, how did you, you um, sorry, yeah, mate. Sorry? Just wondering how you did the, the webbing, is that, um, a rig, 
a, a webbing rig? So, I probably went about this, I went about the webs probably overkill, but there was some, I wanted, again, to have kind of full creative license. I didn't want to be fighting with a rig, because in my experience, one of the hardest things to animate in 3D animation is things like ropes, uh, you know, a spider web, for example. Yeah. There's always something that makes it just slightly more difficult to do when if it comes to just how the rig is set up or using different like workflows and to have full creative license essentially what i did which you can see in the making of online is i attached a um a measure there's a you can use a measure distance tool in maya where basically it creates a line just like a pixelated line from one point to another using locators and so what I did is I added a locator to whatever arm was firing, and then another, and then the other point would be wherever I wanted it to attach to the building. And then using that, I would animate that on and off at different moments uh, to give me a template for where <coughs> that web would be in perspective to the camera. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I brought that into uh, Toon Boon Harmony, and I. 2D animated like a template of mm. how I wanted that web to like move and uh, like bend and stretch. And then from there, I brought that into Photoshop and painted it by hand. Yeah, beautiful. That's great. Um, so how did you, some... um, you have some like, you know, there's some curves as it's, you know, before it straightens out, is that all just added in yeah. frame by frame as well? Yeah, so all this stuff here where you've got like, it almost thickens. Mm -hmm. So when it feels, I almost wanted to give it like a motion blur feel. So whenever it fires very quickly, I wanted it to almost like, you know how when you look at a guitar and you pluck the string and it go, it looks like it's getting wider and then it gets thinner again. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So I almost wanted to sell that frequency. So whenever it fires very fast, then it has like this thickened effect and then it goes back to the thin once it's taut yeah beautiful great stuff thank you <laughs> <laughs> so again keeping these graphic shapes multiple limbs like i was using very similar techniques throughout the throughout the shot um and the i was just con trying to be consciously aware of this like on every frame so again keeping that spider like silhouette and then doing these strobing like multiple poses there was something about it i just kind of liked it almost reminded me of like a zoomatrope you know when you spin the zoomatrope and you see several poses and they're doing the same animation but like offset from each other there was something about that that i found quite interesting so i think that's probably where i got the idea from again experimenting with these graphic shapes uh, in the smears and I wasn't particularly fond of these now but I was kind of I was also feeling I didn't have a deadline for this per se because it was just a personal piece but I wanted to get it out for the new year and it was coming around Christmas time and I was like I don't really have time to experiment with how to do graphic shapes for my smears so I kind of just made it up as I was going along almost like straight ahead animation I was just like ah oh, this shape will do <laughs> and uh came up with things like this, which I'm, very, I'm not particularly fond of. Um, just from like a, a taste point of view, I don't particularly like it. But yeah. Um, thankfully, I ended up releasing it in the new year, literally on the 1st of January. Um, I had to work a bit through my Christmas to get it done, <laughs> but it, it paid off. So this is actually probably one of my favorite Spider-Man poses. Um, just because there was something about it where it has this like cool like almost s sharp s shape going from the right limb here to this leg and there was just something about like this unfolding and like whipping like this way that i just found quite interesting i thought it was quite cool so it was this section here this pose was something that nick mentioned which i was going to say earlier was he just mentioned to have the legs together and slightly more to the side of the body and that way you read this silhouette and this is something that 
like I was also trying to be aware of, and he just made a very good point. And this is kind of what I mean by graphic shapes. So he kept the legs together and it made, it forms, instead of having two separate shapes, you just form that into one like more simple one and it reads more. So I thought that was pretty cool. Like that was a really good idea on his part. So I wanted, I don't know, I to be honest, this is such a fast moment that I don't think many people read this, but my intention was um, one of my friends uh, who I used to work with called Owen Fern at um, Blues Your Animation had this idea that when I always wanted him to interact with this taxi somehow and initially in my blocking what I did is I had him almost run over the top of it and he said wouldn't it be more funny and almost more spider spider man like if bumped into it almost like he, he couldn't you know it was such a fast response that he didn't have time to fully retaliate to it and so as he comes off, we had this idea that he actually rips off the rear, the side mirror of the car. <laughs> <laughs> and there's something about that that just made it funnier and almost kind of made it, I don't know, I found it slightly more relatable and it gives him more character. Because when I think of Spider-Man, I think of him as, like, he's still a bit of a clumsy teenager in ways. And so there's something about him, like, accidentally breaking something and being like, oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> and I, I liked that idea so even though you probably don't read it I didn't just justify the idea um, to the best of its ability I tried to get that in there so as he anticipates he bumps into this taxi and rips off this mirror and then the taxi hogs at him and as he comes round see I'm tracking the spacing on the foot there he zips up and then he has the rear view, he has a side mirror in his hand, and he's like, huh, what do I do with this? And he's like, ah, never mind, and then kind of throws it back. <laughs> um, and there's just something that I found quite funny about that. Um, and there's also, I liked the, I was trying to get some contrast in the rhythm, in like the timing of my shot, because it felt very like up, down, up, down, up, down, <laughs> throughout the shot so far. It was kind of just like a one, two repeat. And so I wanted this idea of where it starts to slow down for a moment. Um, and it almost has this kind of like anime anticipation where something goes really fast and it goes into like super slow motion. And so I just wanted, even though it wasn't going to be slow motion per se, I just wanted this beat where it felt slightly slower to kind of change the rhythm. So as we comes down, he knocks and swings up and then it, and then it just slows down in terms of like hit, even though he's not changing in speed in terms of his movement, just the terms of like the and where he's in space, because usually he's traveling left, right, up and down everywhere. I just wanted this moment where he holds and he can read his response to this uh, side mirror. Mm -hmm. And then this is something that I actually, in one of the other breakdowns I did with Sergio Pavlos, on Treasure Planet, which you saw earlier. Um, I find it really fun in animation when you get these movements of like reverse rotations, uh, like reverse actions. So something's going left, another part's going right, and it almost, it gives it like a really cool rhythm and flow. And so as this arm's coming round, I try to get this like, almost this S, to change the color, um, almost like this S line going through the body throughout to kind of give it this cool like reverse action rhythm. If anyone has questions, uh, feel free to ask anything. I haven't been keeping track of the chat, but I don't know if anyone's asking anything. Yeah, if anyone has questions, just post it up or uh, jump on webcam and ask Aaron. But I will read them out for you if any pops up, Aaron. Cool, thank you. So, again, trying to keep those graphic shapes in there. Um, so I was trying to almost separate them into like, you know, squares, rectangles, triangles, and keep that clean silhouette. And so like, there's a moment here where he holds and nothing else moves other than the arms. And that gives you a beat to read that the arms are whipping forward. It's like, whoop. And it's subtle. Like it's, 
it's subtle in the sense that you don't have much time to read it. But the, if I kept everything moving at the same time, you wouldn't have recognized that he had shot the webs because you'd have had something else moving. And you want to make sure your eye is attracted to one thing at, at uh, one time. Especially when you have like fighting sequences, for example. Like you'll notice, even in like say a Marvel movie, you'll have a hundred people fighting at once, but they have these beats where, um, even though there's chaos going on in the background, it may be slightly slower or like slightly more isolated in the foreground for you to notice that the, this action is happening, and that's what they want to like attract your eyes to. And so, even though I'm kind of going for a more cartoony style here, I'm still trying to think about. Okay, when I'm whipping these arms to fly the web, I don't want anything else to be moving. And again, here, I like the idea of these, it's almost like a reverse action again. So as this arm is pulling back to force his momentum forwards, the, this leg is also coming down to already start to lead the action. So you get this like reversed action going around. And this is kind of where I really pushed. Uh, like the cartooniness where I like I really liked this idea that he's really taking up space on the camera and you've got this this is like the direction he's going and this is the direction he's come from I really liked the idea of him like really whipping um, like this action to go around the camera like, go around the screen I thought that'd be really fun and then that also gave me an opportunity as you can see to kind of smear the width of the webs as well to make it more graphic. There was something really fun that I enjoyed about that. You can see here, like slightly more graphic shapes. And like the arm is still trailing behind before it catches up to the rest of the pose. This is actually when I was showing this to Nick, he was like, this is his favorite moment because he just thought it was very dynamic and it had that kind of like graphic energy to it as well. Um, so again, I was trying to. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I was going to read a question for you. Uh, Alicia is asking, what made you change your mind from the Spider-Man pose at the end to him jumping into the horizon? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm glad you asked, because I was very, um, I was like second guessing it throughout the piece, where I was, I, I wasn't showing it to many people, but everyone had a different opinion. <laughs> Uh, on how they thought it could end and initially the way I had it was he kind of does this spiral and then he ends up in this cool spider stance and I almost wanted it to feel like a slow motion shot like I was inspired by there's a moment at the end of uh, the amazing spider-man 2 where there's this really cool moment where he's swinging around and then there's this like super slow motion shot where he's looking at the camera and his arm kind of just like unfolds and spins out a web and I really liked the idea so I kind of wanted to make it feel like that. But then after showing it to other people, the kind of style that I was going for with the rest of the shot didn't really feel like that moment supported the same thing. So I had all these very fast, like broad actions. And then even though it brings contrast, they felt like it had changed style of animation almost. And this is something that Nick mentioned. He wasn't particularly fond of that end up spinning in slow motion stance. He said, if you want to kind of give it more clarity and make the like style feel more consistent, he would have just whipped him to the side and then had him go off into the, into the distance. And even though I was still had like, I felt quite attached to the ending where I had this cool like slow motion shot and still a lot of people to this day prefer it. Um, I also kind of agreed with Nick in the sense that looking, taking a step back and looking at it, I was like, yeah, it does kind of change style. And I don't want people to think, oh, that was really weird. Why did this just happen? Like, it didn't feel the same as the rest of it. And so even though it looked cool and it was very, like, animation-y, <laughs> you could say, because it didn't, it kind of takes, like, it suspends your disbelief for a second because it doesn't make sense. You know, he's kind of just held in midair for a moment. And you couldn't do that physically. Not that you could do any of this physically, but you know, I mean, <laughs> um, it exaggerated it more. And there was something about that that he felt might take you out of it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't. I felt like that was more important than having this cool, like this cool slow motion shot. 
So I ended up changing it to something slightly more believable and more consistent with the rest of it. Uh, another question for you, for you carry yeah. on uh, from sure. Ozeros. I have a question about the scale of the scene and world space, screen space yeah. animation. I guess that's uh, is that your question. Yeah. <laughs> um, so effectively, the question is: I, I I see that this is a really really huge scale um, scene that you're yes. um, but you're able to get some really great. Um, camera space trajectories and arcs and stuff like that yeah um kind of when you when you animate to the camera mm. um do you find that those arcs look really weird and really stupid almost in um in world space or like kind of because i've done animations before where i've been focusing on world space and then when i look in the camera it, it doesn't work it doesn't flow right that's a very good question mm. and it's something that's quite difficult to to like kind of keep keep an eye on and make it feel like correct in both ways and this is why i was saying earlier is like getting the timing the staging and the arcs right was probably the hardest part of this mm. so basically even though it may look like this was all done to a uh, camera it was for the most part other than this very ending which is obviously done to screen space um, it was all done in world space. So basically what I did was I posed the camera and the main, so basically I would, I animated a sphere as you'll see in the making of, mm -hmm. animated the sphere in the moments that I wanted the character to be at that point in time. So I was like, okay, I want him to go under this, this building, he's going to flip and he's going to land here. And then I would try and stage my camera as like, I tried to move my camera as little as possible so that it gave you more time to read the poses. Um, even though the camera moves a lot, it's almost like the camera still kind of moves to its own poses. So I try to think of, okay, this is a key pose for my character. Where's my key pose for my camera? Mm. And yeah. so you that kind way, of... it kind of, sorry. So, so, so you kind of, um, uh, th th using the two in tandem, you're yes. kind of uh, you're 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 animating the character and an animating the the camera yeah. at the same time and trying to say right okay so which one um, how do we complement yes the other yeah yeah exactly so for example this would have been my first key pose and I was like this is where my character is now where's my camera mm. and then I keep the camera in the same position and it just kind of moves to track with the character mm. and then again it doesn't really move position. And it, it's actually this part that I think is really, really effective with this. Like, kind of, it's just got a wonderful and and similarly right at the end where the uh, where Spider Man kind of zooms around and then kind of flies off into the distance. Yeah. Um, it's just got a really appealing curve that mm. works wonderfully to camera. You know. So. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, yeah, it was this this part like from like here to when he drops down and swings was probably the hardest part for me to get right. And mm. honestly, it took a good like 20 iterations of like, oh, it still doesn't feel right, it still doesn't feel right. And it took, yeah, it did take a very long time to get it right. But um, yeah, essentially, this is done in world space. So mm. I would still be tracking the sphere, uh, like all the curves on the Y axis and the X axis, every axis, I would still be yeah. tracking it. So it would be a clean curve. And then trying to find that timing so that the camera could also complement that took a lot of like back and forth and mm. then the thing is it's one of those things where it just doesn't work it doesn't work it doesn't work and you hit one curve and you're like oh yeah that kind of feels right <laughs> so it's kind of second you ha it takes a lot of guesswork but eventually yeah. it's just what the feeling the feeling kind of works um, how did you sorry just uh, another question if you don't mind sure. How did you find, because as you see, like kind of the camera's moving a lot, the character's moving a lot, yeah. um, and you're constantly having to press F to refocus the, the, the orbital um, perspective camera to, to do all the poses and um, all that sort of stuff. How, uh, so, how did you get away with not getting lost in such a wide <laughs> theme that you've created? Sure. 
So this is also kind of relative to my workflow. So essentially, I use a tween machine religiously mm -hmm. in the sense that I have my key poses and I'll do my breakdown and then that will figure out the timing and then from there I'll break it down like in halves until eventually my whole scene's on twos. And then from there it should have like a clean, my key poses will still like naturally flow within each other and I have the ability to manipulate it as well. So this is a technique that I actually kind of, I can't remember who showed it to me, but I was on a TV show called Go Jetters and it was very similar to this in the sense that it's like hyper dynamic and it had like these crazy like anime camera angles and moves. And one thing that I learned is the more you can simplify your camera, like if you have a com complicated camera moves and complicated character moves, it makes it so hard to read what's happening. You have to have one or the other. So if, a cam if the camera wants to do this crazy swooping motion, the character should be relatively still in space. And that gives you, like, because then you can still read the background behind. Um, and so in this case, as you'll notice, even though the camera is swinging left, right, left, right, the actual tracking of the camera is literally pulling down the middle of a straight road. So as we're going back, even though, if you just think about it in translate space, this camera, all it's doing is going backwards. Mm -hmm. And then it's the rotations that are doing all the work. If you have, if you have, you have to think about it in like a real camera. Like imagine it's on like a dolly and it's going across a track. Um, you don't have, it can't move in every axis, both in translation and rotation, because that's what makes it feel like a CG camera. And you'll notice, you notice this quite a lot in, like, I don't know, it happens from time to time, not so much in film because they aware, they're aware of this problem, but you notice it sometimes in TV shows where the camera is just basically, like, flying around. It's almost like it's on a helicopter. And there's something about that that makes it feel, like, less tangible. And so in this case, I felt... Okay, um, the reason I chose a bridge is, number one, it allows Spider-Man to swing from things. <laughs> and also, it's a straight road. So I can simplify the camera moves. So that way I could focus all the attention in the camera on rotations, and I can just have one linear camera move for the translations. Yeah, so, yeah, okay. that's Yeah, that's a nice way of doing it. And like, Excellent. Sorry. Sorry, and I was going to say, like, for example, in here, all I've done is added a focal change. Mm. So it's gone from like a 35 mil, I'm guessing, to like a 50, maybe even an 80 in here. Mm. So like, it feels like the camera's punching in, but you can see the depth perception changes. And so, in fact, the only thing by the end of this, by like this moment, the camera is already static. The only thing that's changing is the rotations and then the camera pulls out in focal. Mm. And then I kind of just animated the character ever so slightly to camera just to create that arc as it pulls out. And the same here. Now this is kind of where, I can't remember how I did this part. I think initially my process, at least if I were to do it now, I mean I did this a year ago so I can't actually remember, but um, I probably would have constrained the sphere to the camera, animated the camera to where I wanted the last pose to be and then baked the sphere back out, cleaned up the curves, and then taken it from there. So that way it still doesn't feel completely locked to camera, but it's still, you know, it's still in this camera space, and I'm not having to, like, really eyeball everything on ones. Yeah, that, that's a really, really clever technique. Cool, that, that's, like, kind of unlocked something in my brain, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers for you, um... Cheers for you. <laughs> nice. I'm glad. That's great. Well, no, that's that's a lot of a lot of my technique that I even use to this day for a lot of things ends up kind of like locking one thing to another, inheriting those curves, and then taking like uh, deleting that relationship, and then using those curves to you know make it more independent. And it kind of it makes them feel like they're still partnered, but they're not completely locked together. So how long did this take you, Aaron? That's another question. Um, in terms of animation or the whole thing? Um, Luo? <laughs> what about both? So, how long was it from concept and then animation as well? Okay. 
So from concept to animation, I'm going to say in terms of actual days worked, it was about two and a half weeks. Um, mm -hmm. So from the idea of like getting an idea for layout and just general like ideas from like the bridge and what he goes under to where he goes left to right, etc. That probably took a few days of just like choreographing. And then as I kind of, as I worked along, things built in. So initially him bumping against the taxi and then the camera punching in focal length wasn't there to begin with. And those were ideas from like either myself or a friend. And I tried to build it upon it. So it wasn't like I have an idea from the get-go, let's just make this. It kind of, you know, ideas were added as I went along. Um, and then, uh, but the actual animation, once I got my sphere generally in place and my staging, it took about two weeks to animate. Um, and that would have probably been averagely three hours a day. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about 30 odd hours. Mm -hmm. um, and then... The rest from like lighting to compositing took much longer. Doing the, I think the longest part of the process was doing the webs. As I said, was kind of <laughs> overkill in my process, trying to paint every frame. Because I think there was like 400 frames of web. So I had to do every single frame book from scratch, which took ages. <laughs> and I remember just spending most of my evenings after work, just like, oh, another web, yeah. another web. <laughs> <laughs> But when I actually played it back in Final Process, I was that's like, great. that's really satisfying. Yeah, no, so. that's good. Uh, how did you get the straight lines on the web? Is that in Toon Boom? Can you just do a straight line? The, the straight line? Yeah, uh, like that was in point. Photoshop. So you can literally like click a point, hold shift, click another point, and it just creates a straight line. Okay. Um, and so like using the Toon Boom stuff, it was all free hands, kind of like you can see this curve here. And then I'd just use it as a template, and then I'd use the pen tool in Photoshop to create a complete, like, correct tangent. And then it would, uh, then you can add a brush stroke to that, and mm -hmm. then it will create a clean line. Nice. Um, yeah, so that's that shot. And then I thought I could take you through one or two, depending on what, how much time we've got. Um, I can at least show you a cool little behind the scenes of some things. Well, in terms of how long this uh, webinar is for, it's just up to you. And if everyone okay. is, you know, sure. if everyone's as willing as to sit get in, bored, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I'm happy to keep listening. So awesome. Yeah. So, um, just to introduce this production, this was um, I worked on this project. Uh, well, I worked on both seasons. So this is a TV show that was on Netflix called Happy, and. It's almost, the way I'd describe it, is like a slightly more violent, grotesque version of Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Mm. Um, and it's based on a graphic novel that did very, very well. And then it was later, like a year or two later, it was adapted into a 3D uh, animated production. And it kind of blends like visual effects with cartoony. The way it was pitched to me sounded really appealing because I hadn't seen anything of the show before. And they basically described it to me as they want to almost caricature it and exaggerate it in the same way you might with, say, a Sony, a Sony production. But then they also wanted to have these um, very, like, subtle and, like, uh, more internal moments that you may see from, say, a Pixar film. This is the way they pitched it. Um, and it just sounded like they had quite a broad... Um, like spectrum of animation that you could cover and of course every studio does every every side of that but it sounded like they wanted to take the exact like the complete extremes of both ends and it sounded like something that was like very attractive to an animator um, and so I ended up working the first season which was I think that was three I think that was about three years ago two and a half years ago and then I came back for season two which was about 18 months ago. Um, and so, uh, yeah, this is with Axis Studios and um, we were based in London. They're mostly based in Glasgow and that's their main office and they made a small branch in London, which they hired um, a small team of like experienced animators and that was like their second team that would take on like two, or th like maybe three or four episodes for the season. And then the rest would be done in Glasgow. Um, 
And so we had the privilege in season two of working on the first episode, which would reintroduce Happy, the main character, who is an imaginary friend of a little girl. And he's this weird blue unicorn who is voiced by Patton Oswalt. Um, he does some really nice like voice performance to work to. And he's very crazy. And he's quite innocent. And our challenge for this season was, in season one, he was this very innocent thing who didn't see the bad in life. And his sidekick, his side partner, who's a real, um, a real actor, um, called Christopher Maloney, uh, would be kind of the, the counter to that. So there was like this uh, contrasted duo where he'd be like, oh, fun and sunshine. And he would be like, everything, like everything's terrible. And so it made this quite fun dynamic. And so in season two, we wanted to, the main challenge was to see Happy uh, grow as a character in the sense that he was starting to mature. So he was getting into like his teenage pre uh, like pubescent stage. And so it was quite fun to experiment with him growing up essentially. Um, and I had the privilege of working on the first time we were introduced to Happy. So I'm just going to give a little behind the scenes footage of. Uh, this is a combination of uh, reference, my thumbnails, um, the final product, and also what we had a process called overlays, which is where they brought in some 2D animators and storyboarders to actually draw uh, and like do a very rough animated part of uh, over the live action plate to give us uh, a clearer understanding of what was happening in the scene. So you can see the overlays in this top right corner, and then my wow. reference in the top left, and then, yeah, the, uh, the final plate. So I'm actually going to turn my sound back on for this. So I'll just go through, like, and break down my thumbnails as well. So having, like, Happy was a very difficult challenge. Uh, challenge to try and find a peel in because in his default pose that when we brought him in as a rig um, he wasn't really designed to accentuate the shapes that you could get out of him but thankfully at the same time the rig was super sophisticated and you could literally grab any part of him and pull him around stretch him scale him rotate him in any way and it was very flexible um and so it allowed you to kind of manipulate him and make him more appealing to his design. Um, and so in here, I was trying to think of like slightly more graphic shapes that you could play with. And some of these thumbnails don't fully translate in the end result. And that's just due to client notes and director's feedback, supervisors, etc. But they, they, most of the time, they're pretty close. So you can see like that face expression that he just really wants to come up on his face. It's really fun. So he had I really pushed his cheeks out to the sides so you can see his teeth. Like it's very, very cartoony. And it was really fun to work on. Oh. Uh, so here we got some more thumbnails. So I'd be thinking about not only my key poses, but how I could really like make a cartoony breakdown that would be really fun to watch. And this this was a challenge because this shot I think was only 14 frames. <laughs> and so I was like, what can I do with 14 frames? That's, they wanted it to be crazy because mm. the intention behind this sequence was it was all like a build up. So he's waiting for the clock to strike, the alarm clock, and then he just outbursts with excitement. And so they wanted him to do this cool spin. And so I had this idea that I didn't really get time to justify it, but there was something from Winnie the Pooh with Tigger where when he gets really excited, he like coils his body. And then as he releases, his legs just keep spinning, even though he's on the spot. So he's kind of standing there, and his little legs are just going crazy. And I thought that was really fun. So I had this idea that as he spins, he got these crazy, like, multiple limbs as he spins around. And then, like, his, like, uh, ears kind of, like, coil in on themselves. And then he <laughs> unravels. And to get this timing, because it was so crucial that every frame counted for such a short shot, I did a quick sphere pass where I just did a little spin timing. <laughs> oh, uh, I thought it was going to play. Yeah. 
just to get the timing right, and then I used that as a template. I didn't like do anything like I did in Spider Man where I constrained it or anything like that. But this, it was more just to get a timing template. So here we've got some more thumbnails. Um, this, I probably think, so this shot was probably the hardest shot that I did on the production because not only was it a very important part in terms of his character development, this is where he discovers that he's going through puberty. And so he sees these little blue feathers under his armpits and he starts to freak out. And so it's quite funny. So he's going off on this little angry tangent about whatever's happening on the scene. And then he's like, oh, what's this? And he sees it and he's like, oh my God. And so it was quite, and then there's like a more vulnerable beat that happens after where he's embarrassed. He's like, I don't know what's going on with my body. And so there was like three massive like character beats that happened and it was important to get that right. But not only from a performance side was this difficult, but also it was in a mirror. And mo the main performance was happening in the reflection. And so it was a matter of thinking, do I animate the thing in real world space and then they animate, then they render the reflection and then they can see whatever I've animated in the opposite direction? Or do I animate, do I cheat it? So I animate the, in, like the inside of the mirror. So, and then they composite it in so it looks like it's the reflection. Or in my case, and I was ambitious, I said, could I have two rigs? Could I make two characters and make them look like they're both doing the exact same thing from different angles. And that way, that gives me the ability to make him look appealing from both angles. Because with his design, he can look quite, it's very easy to make him look ugly from the back. Because he has quite a flat head and he has this very massive nose. And so that was a challenge if I only did it using one rig. And so uh, they asked me to go to a senior from season one who had animated the mirror shot and I said to him I'm thinking of doing it with two rings is that okay and he said that's how I did it too because it gives you more creative license it's twice as much work but it'll pay off more and so that's what I did so this is the final result and yeah it was quite a challenge it took a long time <laughs> So that was that was really tough um, to try and make sure that like right because in the reflection right is left and left is right. So I was like, okay, so this animation from this angle has to still look appealing, but to the reflection that needs to respond the same way, but even though they're opposite limbs. And so that was probably the hardest bit to try and think about in my head. Um, hey. Yeah, so I've got onto the next shot. <laughs> hey Aaron, can you quickly explain because um, Eddie's asking about the sphere technique and the the red and blue yes. as well on the on your quick spins um, yes. just that technique for everyone sure so essentially what i've done is um in order to get my timing right and to feel like the rotations are correct i um would animate a sphere with two textures on it in this case the blue being his front and then the red being his back just so i had an idea of orientation and then i would use a sphere just using it's almost like a bouncing ball. Like I take it back to the core foundations of what, how we're taught to animate. So I would do like a bouncing ball pass where it would just give me a rough idea of how he's going to stretch, how he's going to squash, like his general volume, and then how fast he's going to move around in space. And so by doing this, you can see how the final result and that, that sphere pass look relatively similar in terms of their timing and how fast it's spinning. And just allowing it to even like the squash frames and the stretch frames gave me enough indication to be like, okay, so that's where my pose is going to be. That's where my breakdown is going to be. And that way, I all I had to do was focus on the poses. And I didn't have to worry about, oh, but my timing's not feeling right. And then I have to realize all my poses again. So by doing a simple ball pass, it's almost planning for trying to avoid making mistakes later. So just by using that as a template, 
it makes it much much easier to use and that was the same technique i kind of used on spider-man but instead i was mainly using it for staging so if i animated a ball just as a simple shape to begin with then all i had to do was get the whole rig attach that to the ball mm -hmm. and then the character is going to move where it needs to within the camera space but then i once that's done I'm like, okay, my character staging is done. Now all I have to worry about is poses and my breakdowns, my anticipation. So the actual animation side of it is slightly less than the staging. Because um, with that Spider-Man shot, if I hadn't done that ball pass, I would have been thinking, okay, so now they've got to come down, but now the arm's got to come up, and then the head's got to go left, and then the leg's got to go right, and I'll just it's just too much to think about at once. So if you can isolate your staging so that your timing is kind of already pre, like pre-planned. Then you can focus on what are my key poses, where where's the what's going to lead the action, um, and by dissecting it that way, it just makes the whole scene like twice as much more manageable, and you're not having to overthink many things at once because you know we're only human, and at least for me, I can't multitask like that. It's that classic. Thing of Richard Williams where he asked Milk Cole if he listens to music he's like I can't think of two things at once <laughs> and that's kind of like me so I can't think about my staging whilst I'm also trying to animate at the same time so doing it this way kind of it simplifies it for me at least yeah you also have the advantage of playing it in real time in your viewport yeah so you don't have to play blast you know continuously with every yeah challenge. exactly you can just hit play and just see what's going on get your time yeah disorder. exactly <laughs> doesn't take yeah it just takes so much time off your hands mm -hmm. um so again this is just showing some poses where i'm thinking about the shapes of his body um and then like my anticipation like this is quite a simple shot um and it was just making it fun and like making it appealing really uh let's turn the sound back on so it's quite a fun one but it's just like I wanted to still experiment with timing, so as it comes, as we anticipate here, you can see that the legs trail behind, and then they, as the head settles, then the hips trail and they overshoot, and then that, and then that overshoot, then that overshoots from the legs, and so almost everything like unravels after the head's hit its peak. Um, this is uh, like a fan favorite on the production. So I was told after I animated this shot, a lot of people were like that was so cool. <laughs> and to be honest, I can't take full credit for it because I looked at a lot of reference online. So um, this was a really fun shot. It's just sometimes you just get these moments where you know how to animate it. And you're like, oh, this is just going to be really fun. And so there was this moment where Happy is in the toilet. He's in the bathroom and. He needs to get out, but the door's closed, so he squeezes under it, but he does he can't squeeze under it properly because his butt's too big. And so he's trying to scramble to get himself out, and then he has to like suck his gut in almost, and he's like <gasps> and then he pops under the under the door. And so I did these poses where like I really pushed like the line of action in his body. So you can see uh hold on, let me just make that a bit thicker. Uh so like, still not thick enough. So can do. There you go. So you can really see how I was like pushing, like almost a simple shape. That's what I was trying to say about graphic shapes. Like I've really simplified it into one form, and then I've tried to sculpt different parts of his body that still keep him like connected in his anatomy, but can still create this simple shape. And then like I had these ideas where like as he squeezes his like tail clenches into like a zigzag so then he's like squeezing um and then like his butt kind of gets bigger and it inflates as he goes to suck in so like this is the anticipation pose and like his tail comes up and i thought it's just it's just funny and it was actually really cool because they ended up and they ended up like editing some music to it so you can hear this like whoop, 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 <laughs> kind of sound which is really fun and then here i just wanted to put this this uh, section here because I am a massive, massive fan of Tom and Jerry and I grew up with it as a kid 
and I just felt like this is a great opportunity to add in some Tom and Jerry kind of style. And so I found this really cool reference. There's a shot in Tom and Jerry with, I mean, they do it all the time, but there's one particular shot that I liked of Tom where he goes to run and his legs just scramble before he goes. And so I took those frames, literally just copied them and said, okay, so that leg's here, this limb's here. And that gave me a rough idea of where like the timing's going to be as they scramble. Because timing in like really cartoony, like those kind of moments, it's like every frame counts. And so I thought it was really important. So this is the final shot. <laughs> it's, it's really fun to do. So I'll just frame by frame that. I'll turn in the sound off. Uh, so you can see, unfortunately, they motion blurred the heck out of it. So you can't see all those beautiful graphic shapes that I, that I made, but it's there, I promise you. <laughs> um, so as he comes in, there's this one frame, I'll try and draw over the top of it because I know what it, how the pose was. So like essentially, you know, his horn was here, his ears were back here, this is his head, then like there was one leg around here, tails back here, and then there was one arm kind of around here. So he's squeezing. And then in this frame, the head's already straight away, it's under, under the door now. His horn's still kind of like sucking in, his ears are still sucking in. And then I've really stretched the volume in his body, so now his hips are here. And then you can see now where like we've got, I tried to really scale his butt cheeks. Uh, and then he's got his tail. And this is where it starts to go slightly more into like the Tom and Jerry like legs, where you can see now they've got this timing, I was really exaggerating the hoofs. So like, even though they're not particularly like beautiful shapes in motion, you, cause it's so fast, you don't really, you more feel it than you see it. So you can see how like I'm creating these curves. So it's like everything's flowing in this direction to create this like scrambling effect. It's like I've almost broken the foot back on itself here. And then again, now it's completely broken, but this is what I mean by like breaking smart. So if you can create a shape that just reads and it flows within that motion, then sometimes it's okay to break the root. But you have to be very aware and conscious about how you do it. So you can see there, that was kind of the anticipation pose where I like inflated his butt and his tail's coming up, his legs are sucking in. And then we've got some slightly more subtle, uh, got some subtle stuff as well. So this is, I wanted to show this one because I wanted to give credit to, I uh, can't remember what his turn is now, but Tim, our 2D animator, who was for the overlays, did some really nice performance stuff here. And so you can see how I've adapted his poses into something that I felt was slightly more appealing to his design. But they're, they're very close, like all the performance is still very similar. So I'll show you that. Uh, sorry. Oh. So you can see there how like I tried to create these really nice like graphic shapes in his body. Let's try and draw over that. Uh, so like trying to simplify, like I say, like these square mo like square shape here, then he goes into like a thicker hip and that flows into his legs. And then keeping like a clean silhouette for his neck and just trying to simplify his form as much as possible. And there was like, cause if you think about his nose, his nose could quite simply be a round blob and I felt like it was, you could change that form just by favoring one side. So from like a three quarter angle, if you favored it so that one side was slightly thinner, it just made something more appealing. So let's just get rid of this. This is kind of what I'm thinking about in terms of posing. So then like, 
you know, I could have a slightly more three quarter, then you've got a corner of his mouth. And then like a teeth thing. And he's got his eyes on top. Some brows in there. And then like something like this with his little nostrils. And then like he can add his teeth in there. Does something like that felt more appealing than if I were to like just have a round thing, which is what came in by default. So it's trying to construct shapes that kind of just guide the eye and it makes it more appealing and flows in the direction. This shot was very fun as well. <laughs> Sorry, you're going to say something, Eddie? Uh, yes, actually. Um, I was just going to read a question. So sure. Glad you caught that. Um, <laughs> Shaik uh, asks, Aaron is capturing more than two reference videos for this shot. May I know the reason? Or just one for the body acting and one for the face? In your yes, previous shot. exactly. Um, so basically, um, I tend to, I do tend to do this quite often. I'm guessing he's referring to, uh, so he or she was trying to refer to this shot, where uh, basically I would do, my first pass I would just do with the body. Uh, like I would act with the body and I'm not focusing on my face. Um, and the reason I do that is because you should be able to sell an emotion through the body without having to see someone's face as being upset uh, or happy or whatever. And so uh, most the first thing I'll do is I'll do a pass on my body language and making sure that reads. And after that, I sometimes, it depends on the shot and what it requires. Um, if it's something super subtle, um, then I tend to also do a pass where I record my face doing the performance and trying to reenact the same thing, but just focusing on my face. And that's more for the subtle things. So like maybe I, how I dart an eye, how I blink, how my eyebrows raise. The subtle things that maybe I just wouldn't think about adding that may bring something extra to the, to the performance. Um, and it's not, like I say, it's not something I do every time, but I do try to make a conscious effort to do it this way now, especially with the stuff we're doing in the feature film, um, what I'm working on at the moment. Um, I try and do a pass on the body and on the face, because even if even if you feel like it's working as it is, I feel like it. You know, there's due justice in just doing it, even just to try. And sometimes they're like, mm, "There's nothing in here that I feel like is working," or maybe someone else could reference it for you. It doesn't have to be yourself. Um, I ask fellow animators to be referenced with me all the time. Um, and just seeing like subtle things that someone might do that might help. Um, but yeah, I do try actively to do a body pass and a face pass in reference now. Um, going back to this, uh, there's a really cool, this is a really fun and like grotesque moment, but I have quite a twisted sense of humor in some ways. Um, and so for me, like some people found this, this sequence quite disgusting and disturbing, but I found it really funny. Uh, basically, there's a moment in this, it's an R-rated show, but there's a moment where Happy, as he's growing up, he finds a love interest and there's a, not explicit, but there's an implied sex scene. And it's quite funny because you just wouldn't think about this in you know like animation you don't usually see these kinds of things and it just they made it humorous it wasn't supposed to be grotesque or disgusting it's just implied and there's this funny beat in there where i got to animate this shot where uh happy is pleasuring the other the other half and she says mind the teeth and he says, sorry, I can't help it. I'm all teeth. <laughs> and he, the, it implies, everything's implied, but you don't see anything. <laughs> and it just seemed really fun. And so I really went like, to town this shot and just made it as funny as I could. Um, and so I actually filmed myself on, on my bed, like coming, under the sh like coming out from under the sheets and then like acting this performance. And I even filmed, I got my friend, one, another animator, Marta, to hold the camera from between my knees and then I also did the angle from her perspective where yeah you could see her knees on the side of the camera um so I'm trying to think about it from every angle and these are my thumbnails for it 
and then uh, this is the fun animation. It was really fun to do. It's just, yeah, I, I thought it was really funny. <laughs> and it was a, it's a subtle like implied thing, but mm. I just I just thought, oh, this would be such a funny sequence to work on, <laughs> and so I was very lucky to work on that. Um, and I'll quickly skim through these ones, otherwise I'll be uh, I'll be taking up too much time. But yeah, so you can see here like how I'm thinking about my acting choices. In terms of a question I was asked earlier was about how I approach a shot and what I'm thinking about when I'm blocking. And I think that's a really important step. So something that I consciously do every time now, which I actually, I know a lot of animators learned from this video as well, um, which was a video from Sir Wade. Uh, he has a YouTube channel and he interviews a DreamWorks supervisor uh, called JP Sands and it's about subtext. Um, and subtext is essentially, for those who don't know, is essentially what the character is thinking, not what they're saying. And a lot of people make the mistake of, make, of uh, like trying to act to what the character says and um, not what they're thinking. And so what you essentially find in the subtext is it's not, it's not what they're saying, but how they're saying it and why, what they're actually saying. So if I said, uh, I don't like this piece of bread, you could say that a thousand different ways. And it's the way they say it that creates the subtext. So when you say, I don't like this piece of bread, it could be, I'm really full, or it could be, this is disgusting. So it could be saying like, uh, actually, I don't, like, I don't want this piece of bread. I don't like this piece of bread. And that sounds slightly more casual. It could be like, I don't like this piece of bread. And that completely changes your uh, performance. And so what I try to do is I listen to the dialogue from the character and then I write down what I think the subtext is. And so in this case, he says, uh, you'll see later, you'll see in this next shot, he says, and do you think another bottle of arse work is a good idea? And essentially the subtext off the top of my head is, uh, do you think going back to your old ways as an alcoholic is going to make things better? And so by, by acting to the subtext, you're, it's going to make your acting feel more genuine because you're getting down to the core of what the character is thinking, not what they're actually saying. Because mm -hmm. your brain doesn't respond the same, like your brain doesn't always, your mouth doesn't always keep up with your brain. And so there's, there's something about, you just get a more genuine performance. You avoid like cliche acting gestures uh, if you just animate to subtext and it makes for a more believable performance. So that's that's one of the first things I do before I do anything. Before I draw anything, I'm thinking, what is the subtext? Like, what's the main purpose of this shot? And what what is the shot trying to say? Because every shot has an intention. There's a reason why they, when they storyboarded this, this shot had a specific reason. And so you got to think about what that reason was and how the character feels about it. And so those are the two main things I do when I'm thinking about blocking a shot. So there was something that I added to the performance there, which I felt like, I felt a lot of that was very pantomime, but I, that is also kind of the style of the show. But one thing that I particularly, looking back at now, I like about this, is not any of the over-the-top acting at the beginning, but this idea that he looks away from him and then he he has this angry take where he looks back at him and then he like soaks and he strops. And there's something I like about the acting choice because he's like, I can't believe you right now. And that that kind of like acting choice isn't something that was in the boards. And I could have just made him look and just look away and that was it. But just having a look back and be like, ugh, just that felt something that was like more genuine to the way he was saying it. Um, so Eddie asked, uh, aren't you told those things from the director or the anim soup, um, I guess in your kickoff? So all the subtext, you know, and the performance? Yes. 
Yeah, so that's something that um, we usually run by the director. And on, obviously the animation supervisor and leads will be in that, in that meeting as well, where when we're briefed on shots, they'll say, okay, so in this shot, so-and-so is thinking this and feeling that. And then you can ask them, okay, so um, that's where you can try and decipher how they're feeling in that moment. And then you can also, that can help you, uh, give you like guidance as to kind of how to build your subjects. Um, but in your briefing, when you get your allocations and everything, you'll have your, you'll have your briefing, you'll have your launch with your directors. And that's when um, they'll tell you the purpose for that shot and uh, yeah, how to like deduce the performance and what needs to, what needs to come out of the character. Uh, so this is one last one that I wanted to show. I think it's the last one here, which is probably the cartooniest I ever did. And this is actually from season one. So I did this, I think this was like three years ago. And it was crazy because I actually will show you the progression for this shot simply because I had such little time to do it. I think it literally was like just over a day and a half. And it was absolutely mental. It's very last minute. We had already moved on to our final, we'd moved on to the next episode. And it was always something that was going to be allocated to me if they wanted to do it. But the director was still undecided as to whether he wanted happy in the shot or not. And so it, Basically, because they couldn't decide, they said, okay, move on to the next episode. We was halfway through animating uh, the, next e the next episode. And then I get this message from my uh, coordinator saying, yeah, they want to do that shot now. I was like, okay, how long is it? And they were like, well, for this, they split it up because it the, the shot was one minute long, but there's three different beats in there where Happy was approximately 10 seconds or so in each beat so it's like 30 seconds of animation and for each of those segments i had like a day and a half to animate and so it was rather crazy so it was like yeah 10 seconds for like a day and a half from scratch and he was also very specific about what he wanted so the director would say could he go here to there and then here to here and i would try that and then he was like no it doesn't look right and I'd say, how about from here to here and then there to there? <laughs> and I'd try that and he'd say, no. And this is literally like back and forth, back and forth. Or I'd be blocking, like, I'd be submitting him a shot like every hour because he was so adamant to get this shot just completely out of the way. So it was very fast paced, um, but it was, good, it was good to collaborate in that way. And so he couldn't decide on what he wanted. And I said, Clay, I have an idea. Do you mind if I try it? And he said, no, go ahead. So I blocked out a very rough part and kind of got the staging and like the general like timing. And then he said, yeah, that looks really cool, keep going. And so then I just went with that and then, yeah, came out with this shot. So I'll play that now. And I've got one where it's a play blast version and then one with the final result because they added so much motion blur and camera shapes to the final result <laughs> that it's kind of hard to read. <laughs> but I'll show you, I'll show you both. So this is the shot. It was pretty crazy. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that was the final thing. And I'll quickly try and grab a progression of like that. I have somewhere. Uh, there's quite a few passes, so when I say progression, it really is progressive <laughs> in that sense. But I'll play that now. Hopefully you should see this. Oh, that's very loud. Uh, turn it down a bit. So this was just the plate, essentially. Um, so he always had to be at this moment. I'll just turn the sound if you don't need it. So he always had to start off at that specific moment. And then this is where, basically, just a, for a moment to explain, the car crashes and it rolls on its side and the camera is traveling screen right. And there was this idea that Happy should be trying to resist the like pull that's happening, from, like the force that's happening from the car. And then as it makes impacts, then Happy crashes into the front mirror and then pings back. And 
basically he was the director was questioning what direction Happy should be resisting the force in and whether they should cheat it in certain uh, like directions. So they said maybe he should be going away from the camera. And I said, well, if he's going sideways and the camera's moving screen right, surely he should be going screen. Well, technically he should be going screen left if it's going the other way. So he should be trying to counter the direction. But just for like the flow of the shot, it made more sense to make him go screen right. So that's what you'll see in the final result. So this is where he pings forward. And then this is the director saying maybe he should go screen left. And there was just something about it. It just felt, I don't know, it just felt more fun to me to make him go slightly more profile. Because we kept on always making him, because the shot's a profile shot. So it made more sense for him to be fully profile. I think that's probably where it felt wrong. Because we were looking at it like, oh, it doesn't look right. Because he gave me drawing, but he had draw on it saying, how about this, how about that? And uh, we ended up, yeah, it kept on ending up being three quarters. And so this is like a slightly more blocking pass where I came up with my own idea. Where I, had the, I thought it'd be cool to make him roll under. And then that'd be like a cool white almost so he comes down and under and then he goes from screen left to right and he's more profile and then that gives it makes more sense when he crashes that he pings against the the review mirror so now this is where i start to add in more in-betweens i'm starting to get a bit more timing now this is where i think it's animated on twos no not twos yet so again, this is probably still some more in between. So you go. So this is where I started to add a little more scrambling effect in the limbs, trying to get a few more in betweens in there because it's such a fast action. And then he goes into like the Roger Rabbit pose, <laughs> and then sucks against the <laughs> sucks against the rearview mirror, and then pings back. Now this is on twos, and uh, this is where I drew over it in just our whatever video editing software we had at the time and I did like a 2D pass of the tail um, and the ears to try and give it like almost like a wind rippling effect and then this is on twos with the tail and the ears passed them and then this is when I splined and cleaned it up Um, I've got one other quick progression I can show you. Uh, this is a slightly faster one, like a shorter one, should I say. I'll play the sound for this one. Yeah, so you can see like the blocking pass, the reference, and then polish and clean up. And keep in mind, this was, I think I animated that three years ago, so I hope there's probably a lot I would change now. But yeah, you can still see, it's nice to see like progression stuff anyway. But yeah, I think that's pretty much everything. Um, is there any questions from anyone? That was pretty amazing, mate. Good stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Does anyone have any questions they want to ask Aaron? On webcam or you know post it up here in a chat box <laughs> Eddie said everyone's gobsmacked so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I love that last shot that um, is a very complex shot and yeah yeah going from you know you, you made good use of camera space screen space yeah um, definitely yeah. I think that's something that's really important to make sure you use if you have the if you have the possibility to unless they really specifically need to be in a certain place i think it's i think like using not only like left to right in terms of screen space but also using depth can really bring out a lot in a shot so yeah. like having to go from very far away to very close it, mm -hmm. it just makes it feel more dynamic for sure um our ask do you always draw the thumbnails for your animations not all the time it depends on, it's, it's a difficult one because it depends on the style, I would say, more so now. 
um, if I'm doing stuff that's slightly more realistic, then what I tend to do is I film referenced, and it, like I have maybe I do draw like very rough thumbnails to just see if that kind of choice, acting choice, would work, and then from there I film reference. But mostly I would just go out there. I'd once I've got my shot, my subtext, I would just record myself, and then from there whatever naturally comes to me. I will try and make key poses from. So I'll draw over the top of my reference and I'll say, if I'm doing a certain pose, I'll draw over that and try and look at my character and be like, okay, so these are his graphic shapes. Here's his design. How can I push my reference to make it more appealing and like, you know, a, a very crafted pose that we would in animation. And that's kind of the approach I use now because that way you still like maintain the like performance that you have in your reference whereas if i'm going for something slightly more cartoony then i tend to do the other way around so i'll if it's more cartoony i'll think okay what is my what are my key poses and i'll draw them and i'll be like okay so these are the main beats i want to hit because uh like your your poses are more broad and they're going to be slightly pushed more if it's more cartoony than realistic. And so they'll probably read and there's, cause you're going to have more contrast in your poses. So I think it's more important to make sure they're crafted very well. Um, and then from there, I, once I've got those poses, then I reference. So I did that way around. And then if there's anything extra that I bring to the performance in my reference and I add that in my in-betweens when I go into uh, like the blocking plus pass mm -hmm. um, so it depends on the style honestly um, which way round I do it but at, to answer the question I usually I will thumbnail but it's at usually at different points in the process depending on the style of the, of the show okay um, and Eddie's asking what's this shot here that we you have on screen <laughs> <laughs> so this is a slightly more creature-esque shot and i haven't really animated many creatures before um but this was like an alien uh on happy and again this is a slightly more grotesque moment where basically this is gonna sound weird to try and describe this sequence so basically there there's some aliens involved spoilers for anyone <laughs> who wants to watch the show there's these aliens involved in the show and basically they look like a piece of jam they just look like some goop some pink goop like jelly and the main character the main protagonist chris maloney uh accidentally thinks it's jam and eats it so he eats this alien <laughs> and then he gets an upset stomach and then goes to the toilet and essentially he disposes of this alien and then out of it comes this creature that's now evolved into some weird like tentacle pink goopy thing <laughs> and so there's a sequence where he's fighting this thing that's trying to kill him in the toilet it's quite it's quite a funny sequence it sounds really weird the whole show is super weird but this is a shot basically i'll show you now where uh, i looked at a lot of reference from hercules uh, disney's hercules with the hydra because i liked the way the kind of like so it has this really long neck and it kind of unravels on itself and so I kind of looked at that as reference. Um, you see it here. <laughs> so that was quite cool. Um, it's pretty gross. And each, each, uh, like each of these limbs was like a separate rig. And there were certain moments in this sequence, which I also animated on as well as others where it had to look like one thing so we had like rigs attached to rigs like different tentacles and then uh there was a shot which i can i don't know if i have it on here but basically there's a shot where it comes that crawls out from between the character's legs and it attaches to his knees so it was very difficult they had to match moves the character's knees and then i had to animate this thing to almost like crawl and um, like clench around his leg but not only was these tentacles like wrapping around but they also there were limbs growing out of it as it did it so it was very difficult because essentially i had 
a rig that was wrapping around as well as another rig coming out of that rig that was growing and also coming around. <laughs> so I think there was something like 20 rigs on this thing in the end. It was absolutely madness. <laughs> it took a long time back and forth with the PG supervisor to make it look right. right. But yeah. yeah, and here you can see it kind of unfolds. And then I tried to treat it like the end of this main, uh, this main tentacle was like a head and it kind of like hisses. So I tried to create this like curl that comes around, but then it's almost like in here, you can see this little curve. I tried to treat this like the head was changing direction, which means as that's curling now, it's made this like figure eight where it kind of twists back around on itself. And that kind of made it like a cool, almost like a head turn, you could imagine. That was my intention anyway. <laughs> um, and then from there, again, I was still trying to consider it in like a, I almost felt it like a question mark was my intention. So it's like this cool graphic shape. And then it has like this little hiss thing where it like wiggles from the tip. You can kind of see it unfold and then hiss. <laughs> and then these things essentially just had to kind of stick, roll, roll my stick around. So it was all about timing really and like constraining it to the toilet lid at certain moments to kind of unfold on itself. So Eddie was um, saying you didn't open this in, um, you didn't opt to do this in 2D in Toon Boom first and then follow that. No, in I didn't this time though. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was, it's actually quite funny you say that because we was given a reference of 2D, like they got a 2D animator to come in to give us a point of reference, but they did want to animate it in 3D. So, I mean, it didn't really end up looking anywhere, it didn't look like this in the ends like these shots we wasn't really trying to match the 2d but it was more to give an idea of how it would move so they just did some tests essentially like development tests to be like how would this weird tentacle thing move and i got the idea it kind of almost the way he animated it almost looked like a serpent mm -hmm. so i tried to give it this like snake like quality well, like i said it has like a head at the end and hisses and that kind of thing so yeah that was the final shot um, the only other one that I haven't shown you is this one, which is Bo Peep, who I only animated a few shots of, but I thought this is quite a fun one, where she comes around. Essentially, she can fly up, but then she floats down by puffing up her dress. <laughs> and she's supposed to, it was weird, because she was supposed to be made of like porcelain. Um, I think that's the material anyway. <laughs> I might have butchered that now. Um, like she's supposed to be made of like ceramic kind of like plating mm -hmm. and so she had to, almost like Bo Peep from Toy Story so she had to feel quite rigid but they also wanted her dress to deform so it kind of contradicted each other but it's just a character trait I guess you could say mm -hmm. you have to just take it with a pinch of salt but it was quite fun that when she drops to try and get the dress to almost like catch I looked at a reference from um, Alice in Wonderland in Disney's Alice in Wonderland when she comes down the rabbit hole and her dress puffs up and then she's like rocking down. Um, there's always the best thing about having like nearly a hundred years of animation now is no doubt someone's animated something similar before. <laughs> so it's always, you're never going to do it the same way twice, but it's always good just to see how other people approached it and maybe there's something in there that you can also learn from. Um, which is why I do these whole frame by frame things to begin with. Um, like, there's some studies I've done for myself, like, which I don't unfortunately have anymore. Like, I'm a massive fan of Zootopia, as most animators are. And so I've broken down shots for myself in Zootopia, which unfortunately the sync sketches have expired now because after like a month of inactivity, they <clears> delete <throat> them for server reasons. So, um, yeah, they, uh, they, don't, they no longer exist, but I did do some studies with Zootopia stuff, some like Hotel Transylvania, um, like Cloud of a Chance of Meatballs, I did one. Like, I'm, a big, I'm a big fan of that kind of style, so. Mm -hmm. I'm fairly sure you've studied Klaus as well. <laughs> yeah, no doubt, yeah. I've looked at some Klaus stuff. I haven't actually broken down any shots from Klaus, but I've definitely studied them just by frame by framing through Netflix. But I haven't gone through in sync sketch and drawn over one yet. 
But I say yet because it'd be really cool to break down some. some Several stuff. other animators have done that. Alessandro Comparado and. Uh, yeah, yeah. Or Wade and maybe Rusty Animator, Rusty Gray. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, it's a fantastic movie. The animation is beautiful. And it's actually impressive how many incredible animators they got to work on that project. Like, it doesn't surprise me, but at the same time, it's just, you know, they've literally got, like, I don't know how to explain it. They are literally, they got the top animators of their game and they all came to one massive product. And so it's really cool. Like, I didn't even know that James Baxter worked on it until later. And I saw a shot, they were like, oh, this is James Baxter. I was like, what, James Baxter worked on Clouds? And I had no idea. It's so like, it's that kind of thing where there's like, just looking through the list of the animators that works on it is overwhelming. So yeah, it's very cool. Um, Mark with Rusty Gray, didn't you? Sorry? You, you worked with Rusty Gray in Singapore, right? On Oddballs. No, I I didn't. No, I haven't. I haven't. Uh, oh, I mixed you up with someone else. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. That's okay. No, I've only, unfortunately, so far, I've only worked in London. Not that I don't like London, but I would. Love to, I'd love to work elsewhere. <laughs> you will. Yeah, I'm sure. With time, with time, it will happen. Yeah, with your reel, <laughs> it's up to you if you wanted to or not. So you could go anyway. It looks like they're shoveling animators all over the world from one project to another all the time. Yeah, totally. Um, it's just yeah. whenever, it, a lot of it comes down to timing and, you know, there's so many things to consider, but opportunities will open up at sooner or later. But don't it's you think that it, remote work is going to become more common? Potentially. So want to move? Yeah, I suppose so. I think it it kind of depends on the studio dynamic because I think I personally agree with the idea of keeping things in-house just from my, from my experience, simply because there's something about working in-house, like sitting beside fellow artists and having that collaboration that really makes the really makes the project work. Like, for me, I as much as I love working on all these animated shows, one thing that makes them even more special is, I know it sounds cheesy, but it's true that working with a team and like sitting beside all the people you work with makes it so much better. And you'll get a better product for it at the end of the day. So I, as much as I, I've done remote work myself, but there's something about working in house with everyone that just, it makes it so much better. So I, for me personally, I would, if someone said to move abroad, I would be more inclined to move abroad than say, if they gave me the choice, I'd, I'd rather go away than sit at home. <laughs> I'd probably end up just you know you end up getting locked in your room and yeah but i was just i was just fun. thinking that it looks like they're like shoveling them around every six months or so and most people have like a life oh yeah a wife and kids and <laughs> yeah. houses and that's very true up and go anywhere yeah that is true um i guess yes. that's that's why it's probably important to make sure that you situate yourself when you want to settle down in somewhere where there's a lot of the industry like thankfully for me london is like, you know, London's only getting bigger when it comes to the industry. Like, it's already massive within VFX. And in the last, like, couple of years, like, there's been a lot of feature animation that's been moving over here, which is excellent. Like, it's exactly what I want to be moving into. So I've been quite grateful in that sense. But it's so expensive to live there. It is, but <laughs> they also pay you better. So they compensate <laughs> to some degree. So, you know, it's, it's the same as everything, like everything's in proportion. Yeah, so I'm trying to do some um, some remote work as well. I've just recently this year gone freelance and um, it seems that more video games uh, studios want to get into or are happy to have remote uh, animators because um, because because you can just like kind of say this is the one little clip of motion that we want you to do rather than this is an overall um, shot um, so that kind of works out but it's also a little bit kind of difficult for me um, I mean I'm about almost about two hours away from London and that's not a decent commute and in the city where I'm at uh, yeah. so remote 
the possible, you know. Yeah. Um, I had a quick question on a technical note. Actually, you mentioned you mentioned um, obviously you do your kind of your story keys, getting your um, like kind of the main poses out, and then all the in betweens and all the kind of animation keys. And then you mentioned going down onto twos, and this is you said this is the shot where we animated on twos. Uh, yeah. Could you just just break that down and just explain what it was that you meant by that? Yeah, sure. So. Essentially, what I would do is um, I would have my key poses, and then once I've made my in-betweens, um, part of my process, at least, I try to think, I think for me what it came down to initially why I started having this workflow was because it's how, it's the only way you can really animate traditionally with 2D. Like pen and paper, they would uh, animate every other frame. So that's what they mean by twos. So part of, I kind of just inherited that process because I'm thinking I would still want to try and keep things as conventional as possible even though we're using a new medium. So when 3D came about, I still wanted to make sure that I was doing it the way that was already working. Like, why try and break, why try and fix something that's not broken? So that's yeah, kind so, of my, so you my mindset. So I'm kind of, I'll, well, so you, I'll just adding in more. Um, so that's just, I thought it'd be easier to try and show you than it is to try and explain it. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, here oh. you go, I've got. But it's a case of trying to have as much um, control over a pizza as possible, really, isn't it? Yes. Uh, rather than giving up any anything to chance. Yes, uh, exactly. Doesn't necessarily mean that it's every other frame. Yeah. Or over, but it's just like kind of chucking in as much kind of detail as you can as 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 an an artist creating that shot. Yes, one hundred percent. So the way I I guess I'm half joking when I say this, and also not joking. But I'm also when it comes to computers and art, I'm also quite stubborn. So uh, basically, my other concept behind it was I don't want the computer telling me how I want to make something. So by putting it down on twos, there's less interpretation for the computer, even though it may, sometimes it actually works better when the computer does do it for you. But just for my peace of mind, I still keep everything consistently every two frames, just so that that way that gives me reassurance that I've made that conscious decision to put that on that frame as opposed to the computer telling me, is this what you thought? Mm -hmm. So essentially, if we've got these two keys here, and oh, then, wait. sorry, Aaron, oh, we need to we need to share now. your screen again. Oh, is it gone? Yeah. Uh, let's try again. Hold right, on, let me. Sorry about uh, that, guys. Let's do this. Uh, can you see now? Yep. There you go. Okay. Cool. Sorry. Um. So let's say I've got. There you go. I've got. Uh. Let's favor that in. So let's say this is my breakdown. And then I want to anticipate. So. I'm going to anticipate that down to go up. And then I'll just add in like another six frames or something. And then that's going to be my new end pose. And then I'll just add in an overshoot. So essentially, I've got my, my main keys here. Now, what I'll do is I'll start to add in in betweens every two frames. Uh, assuming I've kept this even. Uh, have I kept this even? <laughs> That's it. It's a tween machine. Yeah, this is, yeah, exactly. This is using tween machine. Um, it's kind of like, um, yeah, it's, it's every, every key that kind of makes sense um, within the two to three sort of yes. key ratios. Yeah, exactly. So uh, just go through. That's what I mean by keeping on to do. For some reason, that's gone weird. Oh, it's this. I don't know what I've done there. Let's have a look. Live demos, right. man. Live <laughs> demos. <laughs> yeah. What am I doing? I'm there. <laughs> it never works as expected. Yeah. It's that classic thing of this is one I did earlier and then doesn't work. Yeah. 
But this essentially this is how I would work. I had a question around that. Sure. Allowed. Uh, so like uh, on every two frames, but does it affect the spacing? Like uh, I'll have uh, more spacing if I want the speed more. So like I'm going against that, right? So you, I think the important thing, like there's a difference. The way I see it is if I have everything consistently on two frames and I'm using tween machine, then I am not having to think, oh no, the way basically part of my workflow is I have, uh, let's just get a notepad. <laughs> so my workflow is I use hotkeys on tween machine. So I use, uh, can I just get word pad because that's not going to work. Um, I have different like preset values on Twin Machine, uh, okay. which is uh, Y U I O P. This is just my workflow. Anyone can use this if they wanted to. But from there, these would e equate to different values on Twin Machine, um, which is kind of what I experimented with, and this is what I use for everything now. Um, and these, these values is what I literally use for everything. And what, for me, basically what that does is it kind of, it takes out the concept of timing for me, because I can always say, I, at this moment, I wanted to ease in, and it can either ease in very soft or very sharp. So soft being 33%, sharp being 75%. And then from there, I only use that as a template for my general timing. And then from there, I manipulate completely everything. But the reason I do it that way is it keeps everything connected in a similar timing, but then I can offset on top of that. So I don't know if I can bring in a rig. Sorry, I know this I is getting I was just going to say that. Can you show that? If you've got sure. Time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you guys are willing to stick around, I'll course. stick around wherever. <laughs> <laughs> because I got yeah, same, how, you're going to be working until midnight. <laughs> at this rate, <laughs> <laughs> I'll quickly show you. Am I am I okay to use Stuart rig, uh, Eddie? Uh, uh, yeah, not? yeah. Go ahead. Cool. I just wanted to check. I don't want to get in trouble for anything. Okay. So we've got lovely Stuart rig. Really, like students. And it's a student rig. Yeah, very true. Okay, so let's just whip out a quick pose. It's going to look horrendous, so don't judge me. Uh, we'll just counter his it's, hips it's a bit. you talking about Richard Williams. Do some really classic Richard Williams oh, God. or something. I, I'm not going to. I'm not going to try a name for anything too hard right now. <laughs> I want to see some more Tex Avery stuff, to be honest. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I prefer a bit of James Baxter myself. <laughs> I'll just, you know, I can I can do that in 30 seconds. <laughs> right. He's waving. Hello. <clears throat> cool. So, I see you pose the same way ba Bader does. Do I? <laughs> Yeah, this is like all rotation at the same time. Other other teachers uh, just use one axis. Uh, I mean, I, it varies. When I pose, I tend to do, I do a bit of both. And Beta says that that's nonsense to use one axis at a time. It takes too long. And also, actually, putting your your mouse pointer on the actual curves, just push the middle mouse button and use it anywhere on screen. I mean. I think there's, I think there's no right or wrong, honestly. I would just. Oh, it's just about speed, according to him. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's. It comes down to yeah. It does literally come down to uh, how much time you've got, mm -hmm. how precise you need to be. If you're being super technical, and if you're talking like say feature film and visual effects, like super high end stuff, then I would be more inclined to do it per axis and make sure that everything's going correct, like anatomically. Um, so now I'm just making up some of a random pose. Another thing I was thinking about 
making poses when you have a <clears throat> semi close up or whatever there you don't see the full body they say you can ignore the feet or arms that are not in screen but what happens no. when you render no well i mean not this is yes that's true not necessarily just because when you render but also because um sorry i'm trying to think because i am <laughs> um i think it should like you're just going to notice it there's something about it that's going to feel wrong and you need to always animate the legs if someone says to you don't animate the legs if they're not in screen it's uh, excuse my french but it's a bunch of bollocks no, um, they say it's, it's enough to animate the hips what the legs should have been doing i think i think you should animate everything correctly like i say with key poses everything should feel correct right so you've got two poses probably not the best ones in the world but nevertheless we've got two poses <laughs> both hands on hips How, you can't get any more cliche but it's fine um so we've got hey and he goes over here mm -hmm. so now i grab the whole rig and let's say i'm going to anticipate well let's do my breakdown first so my breakdown i'm going to hit 50 let's ease in so i've hit zero so now it's gone to 33 you can see on there this is 30 actually <gasps> i lied it's 30. um but anyway so in here now this is my template let's let's do something stupidly cartoony so in here i'm going to keep that leg where it was i'm going to bend back down that means 30 percent of the previous pose right yes 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 no that would be that be 30 percent of the second pose because i'm i'm easing in mm -hmm. If I was going to be favouring the first pose, it'd be minus 30. Oh, yeah. So, let's say that's trailing. We could trail that hand back to, And then we could swing this arm round. Maybe we could change the volume a bit. So in here, we could bend that. This is an IK. I, this isn't my workflow anymore. <laughs> but... It's, if I'm doing something fast, I could do it this way. Oh, this looks terrible. <laughs> but you get the general idea. Let's bring the neck forward. Dude, you're posing on the spot. This is, yeah, this I is know. good stuff. <laughs> Don't bring <leave> yourself down. <laughs> um, okay, so let's say that's my breakdown. Now, if I wanted to anticipate, now I'm going to hit Y, because that's minus 75, so now I'm easing out. So now, I can counter that, so even though I'm easing out, I'm now changing the weight of the character, but everything else is still easing out. And from there, I can build a new pose. But the, point I'm, the points I'm making is by doing it this way, every part of the body is still moving a tiny tiny bit which makes a difference so now if we forward a bit uh, da, da, da. thankfully doing this and jojo gives me a little more confidence because i used to have to animate like this all the time just live on stream <laughs> uh, That's my anticipation. And then from here, I can add an overshoot. So now I'm going to hit 75 in the opposite direction. So that was minus 75. That's 30. Now that's 75. But from here, I'm going to overshoot. So I'm going to take it over the top, and then it's going to settle. And then from here, I can drag the leg. So let's say we keep it dragging slightly. This is really cool because every time that I've done like overshoot, so pay that and then work into those, but just having it as the 75% and making sure that not everything's in the static pose, yes. everything's still moving. Yeah, exactly. really, it's, it's a different way of thinking about it, you know, so that's, that's really cool. Yeah. I'm glad it can help. So now, 
let's say we can really push that back. Uh, I'm breaking the rig a bit here, but never mind. Okay, look at the head, I think. Yeah. I could probably actually keep that. And then to drag it. Okay, if you want to throw out more, more questions. Well, yeah, of course. Have you here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so here, I, I have a question about the main controller under every character. Uh -huh. Should we move that or not? Because I've been taught that that should just stay in place. But is that just for games? Um, so I do key every control, but what I'll probably end up... What I try to do now... Like now when I... the character traverse, you never move the main controller. Oh, you this? You them away from it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I never move. I never move the global. We call that the global control uh, yeah, usually. Yeah, main or global. Yeah. Um, because so, I've seen Vader again move that a lot, <laughs> especially when he jumps and flips and stuff, and that yeah. makes it so much easier. It does, but there's also downsides to using it, and especially when you're on a production, they the main reason you shouldn't touch that is because if you need to restage your character. If they want them to go to the very far back of the scene, then you can literally just grab one control, move it all back, and you've still got all your animation. Yeah. Whereas you're going to have to tweak a lot if you're animating. And so usually what you end up doing is you have secondary controls under. So this is the main. Then you'd have another one which does the same thing, but underneath it, which gives you the ability to use a control, but still have another one free to use for restage. Um, my, me personally, it depends what I'm doing. So with quadruped stuff, what I tend to do is I'll animate the roots like this, and all the limbs would be in chest and hip space, so they're completely locked. And I'll get my main timing on my roots, and I'll just bounce them along like la 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 la. And then from there, I, I use locators to rebake all of that animation onto the individual hips and uh, hips and chest, and then I delete the I'll delete the root animation, and then I've still got all that animation, but now it's on the the chest and hips, and then I can use those to offset them and give them separate timing. Now and then Richard Leaker territory. Sorry. Now we're in Richard Leaker territory. Yes, exactly. Okay, like Richard Leaker territory. Baking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Base switching. <laughs> yep. I mean, it's that's this is what I mean. There's a difference. There's a difference between like animating, animating well and animating smart, and I think there's the two separate skills. And I think like some of the best animators in the world can do both, um, because it's one thing to animate well, and it's also one animate efficiently and like simplifying things. Like you don't, if you have to overcomplicate your shot to sell an idea, then you're probably not making the best choices. If you can do something super simple and everything comes across and everything reads and communicates, then I think it's going to become more powerful. Um, so, I mean, this is very cartoony, but, you know, like if you look at some of my stuff that I might have done more recently, you'll notice that it's much more subtle. And I haven't had to make broad gestures in order to sell an idea because you can convey a lot just through the eyes. Um, so now I'm going to keep my foot on the ground, for example, and then I'm going to shift the weight across. So you can see, like, even though I'm using everything on the template timing, I'm still changing everything on top mm. to separate it all. So I can change the head direction. And I can still, if I wanted to, I can still use like my hotkeys to favor left or right on top of those, you know? So in here, maybe I still want to favor that pose, even though the rest of it's going on easing out, maybe that one's easing in. I can still use my hotkeys to separate that up. So just because I'm using this is what I mean by like I'm thinking less about my timing and more about my spacing because my I've almost predetermined predetermined some of my timing 
by using certain values on Tween Machine. All it all it's a matter of is where how where do I place that key in my timeline, and that's what determines my time. But my spacing should already be correct because I'm using Tween Machine. Mm -hmm. If I've done it correctly, the only pro the only downside to this process is when you go into polish, you have a lot of keys and yeah. Not everything's going to be clean. So as you can see at the bottom here, I use A tools or an emboss, whichever one you have, doesn't really matter. And you can use uh, ease in and out sliders to get a whole chunk of keys and you can clean the tangent. So you get the idea anyway in my process. Um, so let's say I have a cube and then the we still there. And now let's just give it a ton of keys. Now, if I go into my graph editor, you see we've got this tangent now. Now using A tools, I can slide that in and out and clean my curve. Which is super useful. Like when I discovered this, I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> So I could actually create a, I could create a breakdown now. So that's my new breakdown. I could just ease everything out and then ease that in. And now we've created a different tangent. And this is how I clean up my work. And it's something that I try to do. I try not to use every control now. Like I try to, again, animate smart and try and get as much animation as I can on as few controls like, as, like, as possible. So... I used to, when I was in TV animation, I used to animate with the uh, chest in IK. So I would move it around like this, which is, when you think about it, anatomically completely incorrect. The way you should use it, if I zero out this rig, is using FK. You, if I use FK, this is how, you know, you've got a spine. This is how, when you bend, this is how your body works. And by doing it this way, so you have the arcs going down the body, and you don't lose body. Whereas if I move down here and do that, and then bend it, the chances are, even though this curve may look correct, that in my in-between, it's going to lose volume because I'm going to have to create, I'm going to have to create that arc myself. And it requires so much more time to try and clean up that arc when I could be getting it for free using FK. So that's something that I've recently, I reached out to Twitter not that long ago, um, asking loads of animators online, like, who uses the FK? Pretty much all of them in feature film were like, yep, yeah, FK, FK, FK. And I was like, oh God, that's where I've been going wrong for years. And so I tried it and I was like, this is amazing. It makes so much more sense now. And it just makes it so much more easier to like offset certain parts of the body. If you think about it from like, an actual tangible human being, when we twist our body, it kind of works in an FK joint. And so you can offset things a lot easier that way. And so it's just breaking it down piece by piece. And I think that makes a big difference. So like workflow, especially workflow isn't, I would say like your workflow needs to be suited for fast things when you're in TV, because you have a lot of churn out. Like, Eight sec anywhere between eight to twelve seconds a day, but when you get to like higher quality stuff like movies, it's all about making it anatomically correct, believable, plausible. Everything has to feel like it's, you know, real, like something that you'd believe in. So that's when you have to start actually think about my workflow, not from how fast can I make this, but what's going to be the most tangible way of applying everything to make it a convincing performance. So <laughs> workflow changes completely. And that's something I've adjusted to in the last couple of years when I've moved to higher quality stuff. It's trying to, I had to rework my whole workflow while still trying to maintain the bits that made my TV stuff good to begin with. So I still use Tween Machine and on twos to this day for everything I do. Like I'm currently working on a shot which is 460 frames and it's all on twos. And that's two characters as well. So like it looks like very overwhelming on a timeline, but because I've I'm so used to that workflow and I've narrowed it down to what I feel is most streamlined for me, like it makes it 
it doesn't feel as intimidating as it looks to me anymore. Um, Do you also keep the arms in IK for the most part? Uh, depends. For now, uh, that's actually another big workflow thing that I've changed. So I'm doing it what makes the most logical sense now, whereas if a hand is going to interact with another, with another object, then obviously IK. Yeah. Yeah. If it's not and it, they're free flowing, then it makes more sense to have them in FK. Um, because that's how your arm works, you know, it's a joint that goes from another joint, etc. I know we get free arcs when we do FK arms, but yeah. I find it so hard to make them do what I want. Yes, it's... It's... Uh, it is difficult. It out a lot. Yeah, it takes... I think the thing that's the, the trickiest part about using FK is that your forearm... So, like, your, your upper arm moves in every axis, but then your forearm only moves in two, in well, in one axis, essentially. One axis, and then you can one twist one. the wrist. Yes, and then you twist the wrist. So like getting your head around how you can lead an action through the upper arm, which then um, creates like, you know, the arcs and the, you know, the mechanic you're going for in a forearm is something that takes a lot of, like, thinking. Um, like, so like just, I just, an, just an arm swing in a walk in FK. Okay, you set three keys and you have your, your, your swing, but then you need to, to move in and out as well. So it, if you trace the the wrist, is going to be a, an eight or the infinity yeah. symbol. So yes. you have to adjust the upper arm to make that happen. And it's yeah. sounds easy, but it's not as easy as it sounds. No, it's very difficult. I, I completely relate to you. Don't worry. <laughs> But, um, but if you do I it in my case, yeah, then you have to have like 15, 16, maybe 20 keys to do the yes. same thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Um, that's where like workflow definitely comes into practice. And it's just something you have to keep trying until you get something that comes natural to you. And that's what I meant when I told you earlier of, of, of this stream that I get yeah. bogged down with too many keys too early. Yeah, it's difficult. Um, the way I would try and think about it is try and think about it in key poses and then think about your in-betweens later because the more you flesh out that way, so if you think about your key poses, then you'll break down your anticipation and your overshoot. Once you've got those five keys down, then that's going to flesh out, that's going to determine quite a lot of your in-betweens. Um, at least if you've done those keys properly, then you should be like, okay, to fix this, to have this intention, this bit has to be at this point, and it kind of already like simplifies all those things for you. Um, so, and yeah, we can I, continue this off stream. Yeah, yeah, you get it anyway. <laughs> Otherwise, going on tangent. Yeah. So on that note, um, I'm going to wrap it up, but I'll yeah, give you sure. one more question, um, and cool. and that is: Is there any advice for, I guess, students or animators who are trying to break in? Uh, trying to reach their, you know, their next level, trying to reach their goals. Um, sure. Yeah, what bit of advice would you give them before you head off? I think one of the most important things is, like, we all have, I think it's something that you got to fit, you got to have something that feels like that you personally connect with and not try and inherit something that someone else has made because that's something that's like more genuine to to them like to come out with i'm let's say i'm talking about like a pose or like a performance i see a lot of people trying to copy others and i feel like that doesn't necessarily like what what people look for in animators is someone that can bring something different and something that's like come from them and that's actually what made me land my first job is they saw potential. I, to be honest, my animation wasn't very good, but they saw the potential because I was pushing, I was pushing things that like to me just felt like I personally connected with. Um, and I think they saw that because like, you almost, if you can have a voice in your animation, I think that's really important because anyone can teach you the mechanics. Like if you do, if you, you know, if you were do, learning how to like skip a rope, if you did it 500 times, eventually you're going to learn it. So it's the same way with animation. I think anyone can learn to animate 
in, like from a technical point of view in terms of execution, but I don't think anyone can like naturally come up with like a genuine performance. And I feel like that's really where an animator's voice comes out. So for me, when I'm looking for like some like a new upcoming animator, and I can see like this person is going far. To me, it's more in their ideas and their choices and why they did things. Like there was a simple someone animated recently, someone lifting a box, and it was just like a, a weight exercise. But the reason I liked it wasn't necessarily because it was animated well, but it was the idea that like he huffed up his chest and then as once he picked it up, he used his knee to nudge it up again to like keep the weight momentum. And I was like, that's quite a cool choice. Just have the knee nudge it up because that's something you would naturally do. And so it's that kind of acting choice that I'm just like, the fact that they even thought to put that in rather than just having someone lift something up naturally and then just walk off with it. I was just like, that's just a little, a little something that makes it more special. So I think that's, that's something that's something I'd advise is just try and think about something that you personally connect with. If you were to do something yourself, how would you do it? And bring like that's that extra thing that you could bring to the table that someone else might not be able to. Sure. Yep. That's a great answer. Okay, we'll have one more <laughs> question from Shike, sure. and then that's it. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Hey. Hey, Adam. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. Yourself. Yeah, so I was thinking that if I'm, I saw your uh, workflow that you had two key poses yeah. and then you had one in between and then one anticipation and then one is overshoot, like, yes. right? So uh, this is the bar, this is for one shot, like if I'm doing a 200 frames acting shot or dancing shot, yep. so how can I, how can I go? those short into these kind of pieces. Okay, so let's say you were doing a dance, I would watch, if I would either look at, well, I would definitely look at some reference first, I'm assuming mm -hmm. you've had some reference, and I would I would go through it frame by frame, and I'll be like, where are the key poses? And from there, once I've made those key poses, I would pin those down and say, okay, now where's my in-between? And I would think about it that way. Or even you could construct your own in between from there. Like you've got to think from A to B, what's going to leave the action, what's going to overlap, how's the body's volume going to change, all those kinds of things. And then from there, the in betweens will almost, like I say, once you've got those five things down, I'm not saying this isn't like some miraculous workflow that's going to work every time. <laughs> like I'm not going to, that's a disclaimer, like it's not going to work every time. So, Yep, yep. I just I want to make that clear. Um, uh -huh. Sometimes it takes a bit more work, but for the most part, in terms of my experience with it, for the most part, I feel like that workflow, using those five keys, gives me m the majority of that of like what's going to structure the mo like the whole animation, and I'll do that from each pose to pose, and having those five keys, including those two key poses. Um, that's going to, yeah, that will determine the rest of it. And then from there, obviously you can add in secondary actions and stuff like that. If you wanted a hand waving on top of a walk, you know, that kind of thing. And that's where you can start to add in the textures later. But I feel like getting those main mechanics down comes from those five keys. And then you can always tweak it later um, using other methods and different techniques, you know, so. Like you saw, I use A-Tools. That's part of my workflow to adjust things after everything's down on twos. And it's quite a, I feel like it's a relatively efficient uh, way to adjust things on the fly. Cool. Thanks. Uh, yes, thank you, Adam. Yeah. Thanks for your time. Thanks for your question, everyone. Um, thanks. Yeah. Thanks gonna, for the seminar. Going to end and it thanks there. Thanks for coming along, everyone. And thank you, Eddie, for having me on board. Like, it's been really nice to speak to everyone and share some knowledge. No worries. Thanks, yeah. Adam. Thanks, Eddie. Thanks, Adam. <laughs> no worries, thanks. guys. We'll speak soon. <laughs> and look out for the upload. Uh, I'll probably do that today. So, But again, thanks, awesome. everyone. And thanks, Aaron. Thanks for your time. No problem. All right, we'll guys. See ya. See ya. Bye. Thank you all.